webinar. Okay. Which then if we have participants, I will yeah, attendees, I'll... you can keep and it starts recording. So um, we are recording. I just want to welcome everybody to the uh, Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting on Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. Um, just to remind everyone of the strategic plan goals that were developed a few years ago that sort of guide a lot of the decision making that we um, that we do. It, um, health and well-being, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facilities, and environmental responsibility. So a roll call. Heather Altenberg is here. Kimberly Carr. Here. Uh, Phil Saucier. Here. Elizabeth Seyfried. Here. Uh, Cindy Bolt. Here. Jen McVay. Here. Laura Domino. Here. Joey Labry. Here. And Ellie Gagne will not be present this evening. Um, Jen, are you able to share for yep. the flag? If we can all stand and pledge allegiance. Hold on, I gotta move. Scheduling made easy. All right, there we go. All right, thank you. Yep. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Uh, so item number one, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Yes, Heather, I have one adjustment. Okay, go ahead, Elizabeth. I'd like to add um, an action item for the board to um, consider expanding the definition of the interview committee. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so where do we wanna put that? Let's see, can we put it under three approval of minutes? And then can we do it right after that or does it need to go into new business? What do you, what do you think there? Donna, is there, uh, like, does it need to go to the end of the agenda or where do we shoot? Yeah, I think in? probably new business. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do it as D. Can you repeat for me one more time, Elizabeth, so that I can write it in? Consideration <laughs> to um, expand the definition or I, I think it should be the makeup of the interview committee for the superintendent search. Definition of the interview committee for super search. Okay, thanks. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? All right, seeing none, moving on. Can I have an, a, a motion for the approval of the minutes January 12th, 2021? Board members? I move we approve the minutes from January 12th, 2021. And I have a second. I second that. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments? All right, all those in favor, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seyfried? Yay. Cindy Bolt? Yay. Dan McVeigh? Yay. And Laura Danino? Laura Danino? Did I miss you? My headphones are hear... on mute. Yay. That's okay. Thanks. Um, your daughter so cute there. In the okay, may I have the next motion, please? Board member? I move we approve the minutes from the January 19th, 2021 special business. May I have a second, please? I second that. Thank you. Any questions or comments? 
All right, roll uh, vote is Heather Altenberg's yay, Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Cindy Bolt. Yay. Uh, Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Next up is we have um, comments from the public. Yay. Just as a reminder, um, we do uh, like to have public comment. It is not uh, a conversation back and forth. It is just that. It's comments uh, based on agenda items. Uh, people who are uh, given the opportunity to speak um, have three minutes to do so about something on the agenda. And if you uh, can state your name and where you, um, where you live in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, we have about 20 minutes. We have a 20 minute time period for comments. So I'm just going to get my phone. You can raise your hand and um, I will call on people. Okay, I have to go over to the attendees. Uh, David, oh, I saw David Hughes and then it looks like a hand went down. And so I don't see I, any I, other I, hands. I got it. Oh, okay, thank Sorry. you. Sorry, he That's should be okay. able to talk now. So, David, can you hear me? You, it looks like you need to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, how's that? That's great, thank you for being here. If you can, um, again, state your name and where you live. All right, I'm David Hughes. I live at 8 Hannaford Cove Road with my wife and two boys. And you want me to continue? Yes. Right, specific, uh, specifically tonight, I'd like to address the, the agenda and how it could be improved. Similar to Ms. Wolfman, I, I, as a superintendent for the Scarborough Sanitary District, report directly to an oversight board. I also sit on the board of directors for the Kayla Vale Retirement Home for Women. Consequently, I, direct, I have direct experience on how these two boards conduct their meetings and request that the future school board meetings adopt the same approach. Both boards now have standing COVID agenda items. I would think the school board would consider a similar approach. That way we could convey critical information to the public. Under this agenda item, you could discuss, disclose, statistical updates, student impacts, plans moving forward. Information provided should include number of positive cases in schools and direct contacts, any known transmissions as a result of schooling, impacts on schooling operation and why. Schools, schools were closed this week. Consequently, the kids will only be in school four days this month. Why? Specifics are needed. What percent of the curriculum will be completed this year as compared to a typical year? What we are hearing is it's going to be 40%. Plans for remedial education, current mental issues. Sadly, suicides and drug overdoses are dramatically up nationwide, Maine, and sadly here in Cape is we quickly becoming a case where the re remedy is worse than the disease. We need to set a target date for full-time schooling, set monthly goals with measurable improvements. Autopilot is not acceptable. Identify roadblocks and develop solutions. As superintendent, hybrid was not an option at the sanitary district, nor could we work from home, nor could we meet all the CDC guidelines. I had to develop a plan that kept my staff safe from institutional dangers of our work and considering the CDC guidelines. We as leaders have to think outside the box to develop solutions. We need to present benchmarking results comparing Cape to other communities. Old Orchards, four days in house school in Camden, Rockland, Rockport, sorry, full time. Biddeford using grant money to hire college kids. Parochial schools have been in school full time since September. Uh, Brewers using a two, three day school rotation and in Vermont K through four is full time. This short list of examples bring up the question, why can others operating under the same guidelines do more? The short answer is they are thinking outside the box. We need to review current practices. Why is the high school getting out an hour early? Why can't Kate consider synchronous learning? Others are successful. You know, Wednesday's really a catch up day, really a smart idea. A review of my son's Snapchat account uh, shows that half his friends are up at Sugarloaf on Wednesdays. Another standing agenda item on both boards is correspondence. I know the school board and the superintendent get on a lot of it. 
A presentation of all correspondence received from parent, parent, parents should be considered. Is if it's too you many. You can finish up, David, please. That's three minutes. Okay, I will very Thank quickly. You. A summary could be provided. And finally, a public comment period should be open to all items. Uh, agenda item comments would be more valuable given that those specific times. Answers need to be provided, not just acknowledgement and speakers' comments. Uh, we'd like to approach and uh, develop a plan and become the leader in education that Cape once was. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Oh, okay. I see Tasha Novak. I think I gave you permission. You yes, should be able you, to. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. If you could um, state your name and where you live. Um, yes, my name is Tasha Novak. I live at 8 Coalfield Road. Um, okay. I live with my husband and my four children. I have a daughter at the middle school and a daughter at Pond Cove. Um, I'm a registered nurse and I've been a nurse for about 11 years. I also have a degree in public health nursing. Um, my husband's a physician. We both work at Maine Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> I have been working from day one of this pandemic. Um, I've been redeployed to COVID units and I've witnessed the real and most devastating effects that this virus can have. As adults, we must take this seriously, but COVID-19 for the most part is a virus that causes adult disease and it is largely transmitted among adults. Solid research has shown time and again that children are just not primary vectors of this virus. In fact, there is still not one reported case, worldwide documented case of child to adult transmission. So with this current overwhelming evidence, why are schools the most restrictive institutions during this pandemic? The American Academy of Pediatrics has stated more than once that schools need to open fully and that it is urgent. The pediatric morbidity and mortality rates are drastically higher since schools began closing. Child obesity and depression, as well as suicide is on the rise. Statistically delayed development in small elementary school children is actually on the rise as well. I trust my pediatric colleagues and I hope that the school board members and the superintendent will too. Children are not thriving right now. This is an emergency. The CDC has stated that schools do not have to wait for teachers to be vaccinated to fully open or reevaluate their restrictions. This is because the CDC hopes that school districts will allow children to return to school full time. We cannot wait for children to be vaccinated. We could be waiting for years. The FDA will not likely authorize emergency use of the vaccine in children as they have developing immune systems and they are not high risk or rapidly spreading this virus. We will likely wait for FDA approval. This may mean sacrificing a normal elementary school education for my first grader who has ordered half of her kindergarten year. She will never sit next to her teacher or read a book or work out a math problem. She will stare at an iPad screen for the remainder of her formative years. The consequences of this will be devastating. Some of these restrictions as enforced by the CAPE schools are not just nonsensical, they are harmful. I have personally spoken with representatives from the CDC and from the Department of Education who both assured me that many of these restrictions are not enforced by these institutions. For example, children at the middle school are not allowed to drink water during the school day because they cannot remove their masks. This is not only unnecessary, but cruel and abusive. Grocery store workers, hospital workers, and others are allowed to remove their masks to hydrate. Why can't children who actually dehydrate faster than adults, especially when they have to wear masks, all day, which add to their dehydration. The middle school children are also not allowed gym and real physical exercise. When my daughter's pediatrician asked her if she was getting any exercise at school, she replied, no, because of the COVID rules, but we have Zoom PE. He asked her, what, Zoom, what is Zoom PE? She said, we mostly just watch videos. What are we doing to this generation? We, the parents are pleading to the school board and to the superintendent to use the most updated science-based research to get creative so we can prevent further harm to our children. We need strong leadership now more than ever. We need the school board members and the superintendent to start really advocating for our children. School is absolutely essential to their well-being. The damage being done to our children- Do you mind, right now, um, Tasha, finishing up, please? Yes. Sorry. The damage being done to our children right now far outweighs the damage, the risk, of opening the schools and giving the children the wholesome and unimpaired childhood they deserve. Thank you. 
Uh, Stacy, I don't see last name. Stacy Hughes, you should be able to unmute yourself. You are next to speak. Thank you. Great. Thank you. My name is Stacy Hughes. I live at 8 Hannaford Cove uh, with my husband and my two boys. And I would like to speak to agenda items number five and number 11, um, looking at comments from your student representatives as well as from your um, committee reports. Um, again, looking at the listing of committees and the, the student reports and principal reports. Um, I would like to propose um, and request a committee be developed to focus mainly on the COVID and pandemic issues only. Um, looking at updates, roadblocks, solutions, future planning for the school opening. Um, you know, suggesting that the school board have these monthly updates just as other committees are able to update on a monthly basis. It's so critical that the public um, be informed as to what the school board is doing, as well as administration to support our students and our teachers, to look at the latest data, to plan for the opening of our schools and to respond to parents' concerns and questions. As it stands now, not being on the agenda as a set committee gives the public a statement, a statement that this is not being addressed at all. Going forward through the rest of this pandemic and beyond, I am hopeful that there be an ongoing parent or group of parents, perhaps a representative from each school, much like you have your student representation from the high school, you have your administrative representation. Each month we get to listen to the principal's reports. I am suggesting and hoping that there be a parent representative from each school um, that is also on the agenda each month that brings concerns, questions, of course right now the issue being COVID, but moving forward, it could be anything. It could even be to share accolades, positive happenings going on in the school. Um, and again, just a place to offer monthly updates for parents. This, I strongly feel, would complete the triangle of communication that is so desperately needed right now more than ever, but also moving forward. That triangle being communication between administration, students, and parents. That's the only way things are going to work moving forward. It is my hope that you would consider this, that parents need to be within that triangle to be represented and to be part of that communication. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stacey. I'm looking over at attendees and I'm not seeing any more hands raised. Oh, I see Alexander Parsons. I think I've just given you permission to speak. Hi, this is Amy Parsons, Alexander Parsons' wife. And spokesperson. <laughs> uh, we okay. live at 43 Stony Brook here in Cape. Um, Thank you. And I, I think to, to dovetail um, with what Stacy just said, Communication is integral. Um, I'm tuned in now. I, um, for whatever reason, I was under the impression that COVID and the effects of the pandemic were being discussed routinely at the school board meeting because this is such a significant impact on our children. Um, and I was surprised to learn that um, there were not monthly or routine discussions about updated data updated science and discussions about when we're getting these kids back to school. Our daughters are in sixth grade and fourth grade, and we have a son who would be matriculating into kindergarten next year. We are now terrified about whether or not we need to make a decision to hold our son back when he is so ready, so ready to be in kindergarten. But under the current circumstances and with no communication about what the plan is moving forward or when the plan is to get these children back to school, we feel that we're caught, caught between a rock and a hard place. Like so many parents, I am deeply, deeply concerned about the emotional and educational well-being of my children. 
I am concerned about how little they are learning, the lack of social interaction and the isolation they have endured for so long now, and what this means for their psychological, emotional, physical, and educational development. I watch them every day because my husband and I are both working from home, full-time jobs. And we watch that our children, our daughters in sixth and fourth grade seem foggy and dazed. They are having trouble focusing. They are not who they were because they lack the structure that our children need in school. Our children love school. They love their teachers. There is nothing they love more than talking about what they're learning in school and they are starving to death right now. My question is why, if the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC and psychiatrists from all across the board are saying these kids need to be back in school, why is a, a community like CAPE, which has amazing resources, unable to get these kids back? I understand that this is anecdotal, but we have friends all over the country and their children are going to school five days a week and they're in communities that don't have near the resources that we have here in Cape. I'm, I feel that I am failing my children as a parent because I haven't asked why this is still going on. I haven't asked why there is no innovation or creativity or ability to think outside of the box. We understand that there are guidelines and that guidelines have to be followed but there are, as, as everyone who spoke before me, ways to innovate and be creative and ways to get our kids back to school. I Thank guess- Thank you. That's three minutes, if you could just finish up. Sorry, just, I don't- yeah, I think, you know, the latest data is this pandemic is not ending for our kids. They may well not be vaccinated for a very long time. And to consider the long-term effects and the fact that there are no discussions about this is disheartening and upsetting as we make plans moving forward. Thank you for your time. Are there any other comments? Um, okay, Kelly Fredericks, it looks like you have permission to speak. If you can just give your address. Can you hear me, Kelly? I can hear a little noise in the background. Can you hear me, Kelly? Oh, can you hear me, Heather? I can now, Kelly. Okay, if you can just can state you your address. Or... I can't see you, Okay, but that's um, okay. My... But I can hear you and my... you are coming a little bit in and out. Perfect. I know you don't okay, have the best let me try to be clear. from where you guys are. Um, hi. <laughs> My name is Kelly Fredericks. I live at One Miss Thing. Could you hear that? Okay. Not really. All right. Let me um, let me try something different. Let me just go. Okay. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Much better. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. And I just have a couple things. I probably won't even take three minutes. Um, a few of my concerns are, um, I'm concerned at the high school about two things. One is I still don't understand why the high schoolers are getting out at 1.30. I know there is a time at 1.30 that they can meet with advisors and such, but we're not finding that time useful. Um, and most of the people we know are not as well. So I find that it's very, um, we're not using our time wisely. It's just another wasted hour. Um, and also with the Wednesdays, we're also finding at our home that Wednesdays are now sort of feeling like the weekend and it's kind of frustrating. Um, there's not enough work being um, offered for the kids, no structure. Um, I know this has been said before. My second item is in the middle school, um, I'm concerned about the gaps, especially with math. So for example, if a student is taking algebra, um, I'm just using this as an example, they're only getting at this point this year, maybe 40%, 50 at best of the content in the class. So 
next year, in theory, if you're taking algebra this year, you would move to geometry the following year and then as a freshman. So if you were in seventh grade, you would be taking algebra now. Eighth grade would be geometry. And then when you move to the high school, it would be algebra too. So my question is, if they're only getting half of the content, then in theory, they would move to geometry, which doesn't use that much algebra from my understanding. But then they will start high school with not only a year gap, but with only half of a course. Um, I do understand that the school has purchased the Ascend program, which I think is lovely and a great um, tool to use to support the curriculum. But I'm just wondering if there are any plans in place to work on that gap, especially with math. And um, I imagine it's the same in the high school too. I mean, it's sort of like once these classes are done, it just kind of feels like a one and done. So that was my concern there. And that's it, I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention that that is how I was feeling. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any other public comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any at the moment. Um, and this was suggested once by board member Cynthia Volz to share, I believe the attendees are not able to see how many are here. Uh, there are 21 panelists and there are 74 attendees at the moment. So thank you for all who are tuning in. Um, where is Mr. Joey? We are up to uh, comments from student representatives. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. So I'm going solo this time. Ellie couldn't make it, but she's here in spirit. So we're going to start off with the club and organization report. So Model UN had its first competition and to my understanding, it was a pretty fun endeavor for our students and it was well accomplished by many of our other students. I believe two got uh, highly rated position papers and another got best delegate. So I'm not 100% sure what those awards mean, but they sound like good things by far. And then just a note for class fundraisers, the class of 2021 is selling a flag. So if you want to support seniors and show a little bit Cape Pride, uh, I believe the link is in the daily announcement. So get out there and show some CHS, CEMS, PC, PS. I, I was close <laughs> to that last one, uh, Pride. And just to, uh, to note under achievements to be noted, uh, both the speech and debate teams placed second overall in their last tournament, which has been a fantastic season for us this year. And I'm glad to see that that role is continuing. Under student life, I did see this post from uh, Jen Larkey, which is the uh, main DOE is opening up uh, applications for a uh, student representative on the uh, State Board of Education, and I'd just like to encourage all students, all qualifying students, which would be sophomores, to apply. I applied, oh, you're going to make me sound old, about two or so years ago. I went through the whole process. It was, it was a fantastic experience to do that, and I feel like many of our students could benefit from that, uh, that process, even just going through the interview and going through the application. It it really prepared me quite well. So I, I would encourage our students to uh, take note of this opportunity and hopefully apply. Now, no new student concerns have been brought to my attention. I think we are, we're pretty solid at this time. Although I would like to warn the board that we are approaching senioritis season. So we gotta be careful of that, but uh, I encourage all CAVE students to continue achieving at the high level that they always do and enjoy a little bit of senioritis because it's the one part of the year that is slightly normal. And I do just real quickly want to address some public comments that were made. Uh, I do think that the uh, 
getting out an hour early is very important for both students' mental health and our education to go over challenging topics. In a normal year, we would have that hour in the middle of the day. It was, uh, it was achievement period. So we're, it's simply just being moved to the end of the day. So that time period would have still been within our schedule. And it's, it's still a very important part of the student's ability to understand a topic and reach out for help. And I think that concept can also go to the Wednesdays. I work quite diligently on Wednesdays and I feel like it's necessary to understand all uh, the topics that I've been given in this abbreviated time period. So do any board members have any questions about my presentation? Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. Um, so we have a presentation. Uh, I think I'll pass it over to Joanne Lee and Rob Wheeler. Um, um, <laughs> welcoming you, thank you. You, the 2021 All Eastern Honor Mixed Choir Recognition. So passing it over. Great. Well, I'll start with the All Eastern recognition. This year, we were very honored and delighted to have one of our choir students recognized by the National Association for Music Education um, to have selected one of our own students for the All Eastern Division Mixed Choir. That student is Emma Frothingham, and Emma was selected to be part of this choir. This is a huge honor. Yes, and I see, I see Rob applauding. This is a huge honor for Emma. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the article that was featured on the front page of the Cape Courier, but this honor is, um, it, it is, as I said, a huge honor for Emma. The, the students that are selected for this have to have qualified at their state festival prior to being considered for All Eastern and not every student that qualifies for their state music festival are selected for All Eastern. So there's a process that goes above and beyond being selected for All Eastern. The festival this year will be held on March 4th through the 6th and there will be a series of master classes and a virtual festival that Emma will be taking part in. And it is um, something that Maine only gets to select 2% of the participants in this festival. So uh, Emma is among a very select group of musicians and I am incredibly proud um, of that. So I am going to, um, to divert well, I should also, um, I will, I'll talk about Allstate after that. I know I'm going to hand uh, the next portion off to Rob to talk about Allstate for band, and then he'll toss it back to me to talk about Allstate for choir. So Rob, take it away. Thanks, Joanne. I feel like we're, I feel like we're doing the, uh, the parade, you know, and this next float is, you know, um, very good. So uh, we had four students from uh, Cape Elizabeth High School that were selected for this year's uh, All-State uh, Festival from the band. Uh, and all four of them are going to play in the band for All-State. Sophia Toon on flute, Ava Corbin on flute, Zoe Burgard on percussion, she with the snare drum, and uh, Heath Kennedy uh, on tuba. And I think it's important to note that three, the, the first three I mentioned there are all freshmen. And that is a tremendous, uh, tremendous job that they're doing. This year, as we're all aware, is uh, uh, replete with difficulty <laughs> and, and trying to do these things. And the circumstances with which they had to audition were also very, very tough. They recorded themselves and sent it all in digitally, did all these things uh, on, on their own. Um, and it's a tremendous effort on their part. And uh, I'm very, very pleased and honored to have them as part of that and uh, our Cape family. So I'm gonna pass it back to Joanne so that she can explain a little bit about the festival itself. Thanks, Rob. So in addition to our four instrumentalists, we have two vocalists who were also accept accepted to the main Allstate Festival. Those students this year were Emma Frothingham, 
who I will note, this is her fourth year in a row being accepted to the Maine All-State Festival. And also this year we have Olivia Willette who is also accepted to the Maine All-State Mixed Choir. Both of them were accepted on, as an alto to the, to the Mixed Choir. The festival this year will be a virtual festival in keeping with COVID uh, restrictions and keeping everybody safe. So students will be recording parts and then submitting them and being able to work with conductors that were selected by concert managers and ensemble managers so that students will be having an, an experience that is above, um, above something they could experience at the level they play in so that they will be exposed to other players um, at the level that they play, uh, they play at currently. So we're hoping that each one of these students will find this a fulfilling opportunity and they will be debuting each of these ensembles on YouTube. So we'll be sure to send this link out to everyone so that you can share in these student successes. So thank you so much for recognizing Sophia, Ava, Zoe, Heath, Emma, and Olivia this evening. Thank you to everyone. So congrats, yeah, congratulations to Emma, Olivia, Heath, Sophia, Ava, and Zoe. Typically, if we were in town hall, we'd all be standing up. We'd all be applauding for you. Um, we'd be asking you to come up and get your picture taken with us and your teachers. Um, so just know how uh, proud we are of you as um, part, being part of this community and so your wonderful accomplishments. Congratulations. Really, thank you so much. And we want to thank the, the board for their continued support of the music programs here in Cape Elizabeth. We couldn't, Rob and I could not do what we do without the continued support of our administrators and all of the school board here in Cape Elizabeth. We thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we have a presentation next from our nurses, Karen Jenkins from the high school, Jill Young from the middle school and um, Aaron Taylor from Pond Cove. Welcome, thank you for being here this evening. Karen, are you the spokesperson? Um, hi, yes, I am the spokesperson. I'm gonna thank you. Um, go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I put together some slides really just to help keep myself organized, um, but I'm happy to, um, you know, oops, didn't mean to do that. This is what I meant. Um, happy to share these slides as needed. Um, so uh, um, again, I'm Karen Jenkins, a school nurse at the high school. I'm joined by my school nurse colleagues, Aaron Taylor from Pond Cove and Jill Young from the middle school. And we only have about 10 minutes, but gonna go talk about some highlights in terms of where we are in the district in terms of uh, COVID-19, school safety, a little bit about um, how contact tracing works and, and sort of touch upon some of the health and safety measures in our schools that have really contributed in keeping schools as safe as they have been. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, the schools are doing pretty well. Uh, and I would say compared to what we were all expecting when we were doing all the planning back last summer, um, way better than expected. And statewide, the studies would show that schools transmission is, is really quite low and it's especially low compared to community transmission. In fact, it's about a third of the rate of community transmission. And most of the cases that we are seeing that have been associated with a school um, are really the result of community transmission. So what that means is, um, you know, what we're not seeing is people that are actually contracting COVID-19 through their school contacts. In other words, students and staff members aren't catching COVID from each other during the school day in the school setting. It's mostly a community acquired case that then has uh, ramifications in the school setting. So let's say a parent, a family member gets COVID, a student then um, contracts COVID, comes to school before they know that they're sick, um, we have close contacts related to that, um, you know, and that's sort of what mostly what we're seeing as opposed to direct transmission from one person to another within the school setting. Um, and 
you know, the public health experts are saying that those low transmission rates are because of all the school um, health and safety measures that we have in place. Uh, so, you know, there's kind of a, a tendency to want to then withdraw some of those measures, um, but there's a public health saying that says when public health's working, nothing happens, and that's partly what um, some people feel that we're seeing in the school is our transmission rates are low, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, we, um, we let down our card here. Uh, so last Friday, um, Governor Mills and Dr. Shaw uh, did a little video shout out, um, really thanking not just main teachers, but all school staff in terms of uh, acknowledging how low our school transmission rates are and also um, recognizing the many efforts that um, people throughout the schools and also the families and the students themselves, all the things that they're doing uh, to keep our rates so low, um, all the health and safety measures that they've been working so hard to be compliant about, uh, and also guidance to really not let down um, not let down our guard that we um, are still in the middle of this pandemic and it's, um, it's too early to um, you know, disregard our measures at this point. We need to stay the course. So if you haven't seen that video, I recommend uh, you take a quick peek at it. Um, I'm not gonna take the time to show it now, but um, there's a link that, you know, is worth looking at. Uh, so the safety measures that we're talking about are the things we've been talking about for months, certainly face coverings, physical distancing, and along with the distancing then becomes reduced class, class sizes, um, mostly in terms of, you know, the, the physical limitations of buildings um, and school classrooms, um, hand washing. The pre-screening tool has been incredibly helpful in terms of reducing people with um, travel restrictions or um, early symptoms. Um, it's keeping them out of our buildings while they're seeking medical care and um, awaiting testing. That's really helped reduce our exposures. <clears throat> All the cleaning sanitizing measures um, and certainly the new ventilation um, projects that we're starting, um, all those will also help with our school safety issues. So just to um, talk a little bit about what we do if we do have someone associated with a district who tests positive for COVID-19, uh, there's really a team approach in terms of uh, figuring out the best plan for this. And all of the decisions made are guided by uh, the current guidance from the main CDC and the Department of Education. And keep in mind that we have to follow the main CDC, um, which is not always exactly the same as the US CDC. Um, but the, both the main CDC, the DOE have worked together to create <clears throat> something called the SOP, a few little alphabet soup there, but um, which is the standard operating procedure. Uh, and we follow that to determine really what our best, ne our best next steps are. Um, so we interview um, the person that's tested positive or the family members. And our, our initial goal is really just to support these people, to provide guidance, to share resources with them. And then we also talk with them in terms of identifying uh, what um, implications this case may have in on the school setting as a whole. So we look at uh, when their symptoms developed or their test was done, when they were last in school, get a little sense of who close contacts might be, and then work as a team with administrators, the nurses, we may need to pull in facilities or um, transportation or special services to sort of say, okay, this is the situation we're dealing with. What are the implications? What do we need to do from here? Um, what do the guidelines say? How can we kind of think outside the box in terms of doing all we can, you know, to minimize the impact on others? And our goal is certainly to keep schools open as much as possible for in-person learning. Uh, staffing issues sometimes get in the way of that goal um, and may um, cause us to transition to a full remote option, which is what uh, many of you are dealing with this week. Uh, but by far safety um, for everybody is our highest priority. Uh, so why do we do contact tracing? Um, and this is really to identify people who have been in contact with the individual who tests positive. And this is intended um, to reduce further risks of exposures. So we know these contacts are higher risk of developing COVID-19. 
And so we want to limit their exposures. They're in quarantine such that if they do develop um, symptoms or test positive, um, we've sort of broken that chain of transmission and um, protected others, especially others in the school. Uh, in the period of time that we're most concerned about is the two days before and up to 10 days after this individual's symptoms started or if they don't have symptoms whenever their test was collected. So that's that window of time we're looking at. And sometimes there's a little bit of delay of when uh, the test results come back and when they were last at school. So the quarantine period, you know, the details can really vary from situation to situation. Uh, so again, we follow the CDC, the DOE contacts, um, contact tracing guidelines. And the typical definition is anyone that's been within six feet for 15 minutes or more. And that's cumulative. It could be like three, five minute um, periods of time, for instance. But it's important to recognize that the DOE actually casts a much broader net in terms of contact tracing. Um, it's a more cautious approach than the typical CDC definition. So they would identify an entire classroom as close contacts. Um, there's also some situations that are um, evaluated on an individual basis, primarily cafeteria settings, um, school buses, some of the athletic um, events, some of those areas that are, occur in a large uh, physical space. Um, so there are um, individually determined situations, but for the most part, an entire classroom would be um, placed in quarantine. Uh, household members are pretty much automatically considered a close contact. And we see that often in school. There's a family member that tests positive and then um, any students in that household will be in quarantine for typically for 10 days. And again, the situation can vary significantly from one situation to the next. Um, the number of close contacts can vary. Uh, and, and the number of contacts identified doesn't necessarily indicate um, the level of risk to other people in the school. It may just be a reflection of whatever that individual schedule was, or if there were other support people involved, or if there was athletics involved. So it may be more people identify as close contacts, but it doesn't necessarily mean the school as a whole is at any um, a higher danger than they had been. Um, Contact tracing is a challenging process. Um, we try to find that balance between being um, cautious but not overly cautious. And um, we do all that under the guidance of the, um, the CDC and DOE. Uh, so once we've created this list of contacts, and again, this is kind of challenging, we have to do sort of a backwards approach, um, mostly because of all the privacy and confidentiality issues. Um, we can't just, you know, put out an all call to say, hey, Johnny Doe has COVID, who's been in touch with them? We have to sort of look at attendance records, power school reports, um, talk with special services. The high school has kind of a neat little QR code system. So um, we have some spaces that are sort of variable in terms of attendance um, and students can go in, uh, scan the QR code with their phone, do a quick little form. And then if we ever need to go back and say, okay, who else was in that room? Where were they sitting? We have a means to track that. Um, once we've developed this list, the nurses make calls to um, all the families or the staff members. We feel that's important in terms of being able to answer their questions, address their concerns. And we send a follow-up email with resources, sort of reiterating when they can come back to school, um, some links in terms of testing information when they should get tested and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's, it's just important to note, to recognize that this is a really stressful time. We recognize it's disruptive, it's stressful. Um, contact tracing is not easy. It's um, Quarantine is not easy. Um, and we realize that this is a big ask of families. And um, I'm forever impressed by how gracious and patient um, families have been through this process. Uh, so just to sort of summarize the systems that we have in place that have been helpful in reducing um, the number of close contacts we have, and especially in reducing our disease transmission. 
Uh, so our small class sizes um, kind of by default reduce our contacts and also the additional space, um, physical space between people helps reduce our transmission risks. Um, the cohort system, um, because people are in those small groups that are with the same people consistently reduce our contacts. Um, and by being in school fewer days, it does reduce the number of days that we need to contact trace, you know, when we're, um, when we're looking back at that, you know, time of exposure. Uh, the remote learning options that we have available really do support the process. So if we are asking um, students or staff members to be in quarantine, the remote learning options help them keep engaged as much as possible. Uh, and it helps reduce that lost learning time as much as possible. Um, let's think of the, um, the options at the high school have been especially helpful in terms of um, also the teachers not having to spend as much time trying to catch them up if they've missed time, um, catch the students up. Uh, and the, the remote options have also um, supported people who um, have had to miss school either due to mild symptoms or they're waiting on a COVID test or they've had travel issues. Uh, and even if they don't test positive, they're not officially in quarantine. Um, they've been able to promote school safety by utilizing um, remote learning opportunities. Uh, and the high school's mini terms have also reduced our contact tracing, our exposures, you know, because we're really looking at just four classes a day instead of up to seven or not even a day, even over the course of a week. So that's really been helpful in terms of our um, needing to um, put as many teachers or um, students in quarantine. So all these things that we're doing are contributing not only to our school safety, but also reducing um, our close contact identification and quarantine situations. Uh, so the guidance that we've been hearing from the main CDC is to just stay patient. We know this is a tough time. People are tired of it. We get it. This is this has not been easy. Um, and they're stressing that school transmission is low, but it's been low because of all our current measures. Uh, we're all hopeful about vaccine um, that will certainly reduce the staff members need for quarantine, which is going to be helpful. Um, but unfortunately, that rollout's been slower than we'd all like. Uh, there is concern about these new strains of COVID-19. Um, the school nurses, we're, uh, we're in close contact with um, other school nurses, we attend weekly meetings uh, with school nurses throughout the state and the CDC school nurse liaison, and also keep abreast of the um, latest CDC updates through their meetings and um, uh, weekly updates. So, you know, from the comments earlier, I realize that many people um, are anxious for our protocols to ease up, for creative thinking. I'm all on board with that as well. But there's also others that. Um, want our, our, um, our guidance to be even stricter and, and we need to consider those cases. So I feel like we need to be very strict with our guidelines. We do need creative approaches, but we need to err on the side of caution um, and we need to make decisions that are um, made for the well-being of our entire community. Uh, recognize that we're all tired, um, but at this point we've come too far to ease up too much or too soon. Um, uh, so that was a lot. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, um, either Aaron or Jill or I, and always welcome to um, answer any questions if anyone wants to reach out to any of us later. Yeah, so um, Karen, I'd like to first of all say thank you. Um, and thank you to the three nurses for all you have done. And just to clarify, uh, the way our the structure of our board meetings is, is that these questions currently right now are for board members. Um, Karen did share emails up there and phone numbers. So if you are in the public and you have some questions, um, I'm sure that the nurses would be happy to respond as best they can. So that would be the avenue to reach out. Are there any board members that have a question or comment for uh, Karen or Jill or Aaron? Go ahead, Phil. I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah. first of all, Phil? as Heather said, I wanted to thank, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, 
Um, first of all, I just want to thank you all three yeah. of you so much for all the work you guys have done and kept our kids and staff safe. Um, just a quick question on the spread issue. It sounds like, uh, as you were saying, that it's you've had mostly community spread and not school spread. Have we had any cases where we've had positive cases that have spread within the school from someone who tested positive? Or have you been able to uh, contract trace and you know quarantine before that happened? Um, it's always a little bit, thank you for that question. So it's always a little bit too difficult to fully know how the whole thing plays out because um, we also have asymptomatic transmission. Um, we have had um, two, three cases I'm thinking that I know of um, throughout our schools where we've had someone in quarantine um, that subsequently tested positive, um, none of which who developed serious illness or um, even symptoms, I think at that matter, they um, just had had a follow-up test that was positive. Um, we have had many other people in quarantine that either from community transmission, community situations, um, but I, I'm counting three in my head. Um, again, we don't know 100% that that's how it all transpired, but um, they were in quarantine and, and did end up being positive. Thank you, thank you very much. Jen, go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, I did. I just have a question. Um, I know that there's been a lot of talk about the six feet versus the three feet, and I know different kids have different lunch situations. So within the classrooms, I, I understand we're at six, and how many of our students are actually eating in their classrooms versus eating in the cafeterias, and how much does that play a role on the number of students that we can have in a classroom? Jen, I can speak mostly to that because it's, it's mostly at Pond Cove where the students are eating in the classrooms. We have our kindergarten students and our second graders who eat in the classrooms, and that's mainly a result of the fact that we have a shared space with the middle school, and so we have to try to accommodate multiple lunches with the spacing that the CDC guidelines tell us to have in the cafeteria. So that really limits the amount of time um, in a school day that we can get grades K through eight through the cafeteria. Um, and so that's why we have the six foot distancing at Pond Cove. Also because the students um, K through four have snack time during the day and the guidelines state that they kids have to be at least six feet apart when they take their masks off to eat. Thank you, Erin. And is that the same like with water breaks and things like that for the three to six feet? Correct. Yep. The, just to clarify on eating breaks, eating and drinking is at least six feet. Um, and the main DOE has specific guidelines to those mask breaks. Um, in addition to eat, designated eating times, which would be breakfast and lunch, the DOE um, has specific guidelines. They can have up to three mask breaks, all of which need to be outside, stationary, facing the same direction. Um, that is when they, and no more than five minutes each. So that's up to 15 minutes um, for those three. Um, and that's per the main DOE guidelines. Thank you, ladies. And, and thank six, you for all you do. Feet apart. Sorry, and six feet apart. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for all you do. Uh, I saw Kimberly and then Cynthia. So go ahead, Kimberly. Kimberly, are you? I'm freezing in and out. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I just want to um, really just thank the three of you for all the work that you have put in. I know um, this summer was long, a lot of hours, and um, the school year hasn't changed that very much. So um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the um, care with which uh, you consider the needs of all the community members. Um, and I, I have um, kids in all three schools. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I, I guess I appreciate, um, it's unfortunate that we're closed this week for sure, but I appreciate um, so much 
the amount of in-person schooling that we've been able to offer consistently to our students and our families this year. So I, I attribute a lot of our success um, to all that you guys have done and all the planning that went into this. So thank you. Thank you. Cindy, go ahead. Hi, thank you all. I'm echoing everyone else's comments on the wonderful job you've done um, to keep everyone safe. And I really appreciate this presentation. Um, I think this information is really critical to share, not just with the board, but with the community. And um, I appreciate having that extra level of understanding for that. Um, I, I do have a question. I actually went and read the SOP that you referred to. Um, and I know we've had some uh, questions around it as well. There is a, a statement, I think, in a more recent update of that SOP that's talking about, um, it has to do with staff quarantine measures and staff that are um, essential workers. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the section. I, I actually pulled it up because I, I want to, I guess, understand how we are um, interpreting that um, within our quarantining. And I think this this did come up by some from some community members uh, once in, in response to the closure that we had. Um, and it did talk about school staff that are considered essential workers um, who are close contacts. Um, and it has some stipulations about if they could return to work while in quarantine. And um, you know, it says if there are no substitute members available, they take appropriate infection control, including PPE. Um, and the staff remains in quarantine outside of work. And of course it says no, under no circumstances, a positive COVID-19 case should be in school in the school setting at all. But I just wondered if you have, um, I guess, how would that apply or not apply in our school situation? And, and do we have a direction that we follow on that piece of it? Yeah, good question. First of all, thank you. Um, that we are very familiar with that document. Um, I think we practically know that one by heart. Um, that's how we operate. So um, these decisions are not made lightly. Um, I have kids in the school system. That's my job is to care for the kids there, their well-being, our staff's well-being, our community's well-being. So we don't make these decisions lightly. We as nurses attend these meetings with administration as the decisions are being made to provide the guidance as a nurse. And then the decision is made ultimately by administration, but we do refer to the SOP and our guidance to administration. Um, as Karen mentioned, we also err on the side of caution um, as we do have a large community to protect. Um, I just wanna speak a little bit too to, this will get back to the question, but transparency. There's been a lot of questions about transparency. We do have confidentiality obligations, professional obligations to protect confidentiality. Sometimes when we're dealing with groups of people that would be identifying um, and not protecting their confidentiality. But what I can tell you is that we've worked really hard to be transparent as far as numbers go. And you may say, well, we've never seen numbers, but every time we've had a positive case that has directly impacted our schools, meaning the individual that tested positive was in our school, are on a sports team, are on our buses, um, within our schools during their infectious period. So infectious period as you backtrack 48 hours prior to the swab date if asymptomatic or 48 hours prior from symptom onset. So um, every single time we've had a positive case that has in directly impacted our school, meaning that that individual is infectious in our schools, uh, we've sent out a letter. So you can go back and count <laughs> that way. Um, but we don't share close contacts. I don't think that that's relevant in making a decision. Um, you could have a lot of close contacts or very few close contacts and the measures would be the same. What that does tell us though, is that things are working. I said, I have kids in the school and I have a husband that's an educator at the high school. We were not fans of the mini term. Let me tell you that as an educator or as parents. But the first time that we contact traced in the high school was eye opening. The mini, mini term works. We quarantined very few. I think I could count on both hands how many were in quarantine from that case, which is remarkable. Normally there's several students interacting, they're transitioning class periods, seven to eight, I think a day. So that mini term was beneficial for that reason. We've also seen the benefit of quarantine. So as Karen mentioned, we quarantine those individuals that are identified as close contacts based on the CDC guidelines that we follow for that. And we have had individuals test positive that were in quarantine. Um, so 
and that we've had them test positive sometimes after they've been out and their infectious period did not have an impact on our schools. We also have parents that have tested positive, family members that have tested positive, students that are out in quarantine because their family members have tested positive who have later tested positive. So these measures work. Um, so to get back to the SOP, when we're making a decision um, for staff, yes, staff are considered essential workers, teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, they are considered essential nurses, considered essential workers, but it is an option. And when making that decision, um, knowing that we've had people in quarantine who have later tested positive and that these measures work and they're in place for a reason and we've seen the benefits of that, to then bring these folks in and potentially cause more harm than good and potentially spread the virus. Um, that's a hard one to swallow as administrators and nurses um, to know that we are potentially exposing more. And while kids may not, um, you know, the research is out there that shows kids may not be as susceptible and they may not transmit, we still have adults and our building and um, they go home to others. And we just wanna make sure we're making the best decision for our entire community. We do weigh that option. We are aware of that option, but it is an option when there are no others. And we felt um, that ultimately is an administration administrator option or decision, but um, we felt that uh, with remote learning, I believe that that shows it's not ideal. I, again, I have kids, I have an educator as a husband. It is far from ideal but it's another option. It's not um, a snow day or a power outage where we're out for the full week. We do have other educational opportunities available. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Um, I have one question uh, and maybe you can speak to, there are times when we've missed in one of the schools a day um, and currently we're in a situation where two of our schools are closed for a whole week. And I recognize that there's a confidentiality issue happening, but I'm wondering if you can just speak to um, the difference of when it happens for a day and why this situation um, is so much, uh, so much more extensive and so much longer. You want me to take that one? Um, so administration could speak to this as well, but the decision is ultimately, um, and I think Donna's second email addressed that, but it's related to staffing concerns um, and the inability to keep our building safe um, due to those staffing concerns for various reasons. So, um, and I think we'll be a little clearer in that in our first message that goes out to the community. Um, I know a lot of people were concerned and upset, um, but do know that we are being as transparent as possible while protecting the confidentiality. And the first letter, unindividual. Um, so that's one, had tested positive. Um, but the reason for closure typically is related to staffing concerns. And I know we talked a lot about that in the summer that we had anticipated, wow, if. If we get a lot of cases, it's gonna be the staff that make it really hard to stay in person. I do feel from our neighboring schools that I think we're very fortunate um, that this, luckily, I know it's extremely unfortunate this week missed, but, or remote, I should say, but I do feel very fortunate that we've made it this, this far. Um, it's surprising. And, um, I think Donna says that she's asked in her superintendent meetings, are you sure your nurses are telling you how many cases you have? Because we have 15 this week and you've had none since the beginning of January. So um, I do feel fortunate. And I think that's also evident our measures are working. I just want to piggyback just a smidgen onto that too. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But sometimes it's also the length of time is dependent on sort of the timing of everything. You know, if we look at sort of that two days before, 10 days after window, um, and sometimes by the time we, um, uh, you know, someone's had their positive test result report back, they're already several days into that, or we might have had a weekend or maybe with a hybrid model, you know, people were already out of school for a couple of days. So sometimes um, 
just by nature of the timing, we've been able to um, reduce the number of closures. We've also been fortunate, like sometimes, you know, I remember with the summer planning, we were anticipating having to um, transition to remote just to support the contact tracing process. Like that was in our initial letter. We're going to close for the day so we can do contact tracing. Like that was our expectation. And we've actually been able to, for there, I think we did that once or twice, but been able to keep schools open either because we were able to manage things over the weekend and we're ready to go or on the mm. evening um, or have systems to sort of help facilitate the contact tracing process. So we have been able to minimize some of those closures, um, identify contacts. And for most people, for the people in quarantine, yeah, it's a total drag. For most people, we have been able to stay open um, and really minimize those fully remote days. So. For each situation, we meet those people that are involved, those people that it would impact as far as administrators. The three nurses always meet with us. Sometimes it's Perry because it's a facilities or transportation issue. We meet, we discuss options. We're always, our, our focus is first on safety and then on trying to keep our schools open. And often we can be creative and think outside the box and come up with solutions. Um, I want to remind everybody back, if you think back to the busing issue where we came up with very quickly a totally different busing schedule, a two-way schedule, so that we could use um, some substitutes and get our students to school. Um, every situation we study and discuss options this Saturday, um, we got notice of a positive test and we got together Saturday afternoon and discussed options. And sometimes there are no other options when you err on the side of safety other than to, to close the buildings. And that, unfortunately, that's what had to happen this time. Um, we did look at, believe me, all the options. We discussed lots of different ways we could address this. And this was the safest one that we could do with the, the limited staffing that we had due to the situation, so. Heather, I have a quick question. So I, I appreciate um, all your work and everything that you do mm -hmm. and, and all the um, presentations and the presentation um, that Karen did that was great and um, well needed. And I like what you said, Donna, about how you did think, I mean, you think about creating creative solutions and um, outside the box uh, constantly. But my question is, it's going to that, you know, can we actually open, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of people speak about why can't we think of creative solutions for five days a week or four days a week when we have other other children in different states going to school Monday through Friday. So there was a lot of questions on that. But it seems to me that no matter how creative we can get, if we want to follow the main CDC and if we want to follow the main DOE that states three feet apart for students, six feet for adults, six feet for students while eating, we can't double our building size. We can't double and hire you know, twice as many teachers. Is there really any creative solutions there or is it we just have to follow the guidelines? Can you speak to that, Donna? Yeah, sure. We have limitations on space because of our buildings. Um, newer schools have larger classrooms and more open spaces, and they're able, able to, um, to have more students in their classes. Um, because our, our rooms are smaller and we have limited uh, space, we would have to uh, higher double the amount of teachers, as you said, Laura, and our budget just doesn't support that. You can imagine um, we spend 80, 84% of our budget right now is uh, goes towards um, benefits and, and uh, salaries. Uh, that, that would be a huge chunk um, for the community to come up with to hire double the amount of teachers if we even have the space to put those teachers. So really space and staffing is is a huge issue and not only would you have to if uh hire double the amount of teachers but you you think about custodial space uh busing because we're still under uh, restrictions about busing and the, and the spacing that needs to happen on the busing 
we only have a certain amount of buses and bus drivers. Everybody's heard about the, uh, the problem in Maine with um, limited bus drivers. So um, we, have, we have looked at this and we continue, we do continue to look at this over and over again and talk about different options. Um, and this is where we are right now. We do have to follow the Maine CDC guidelines. Private schools do not have to follow uh, Maine DOE guidelines. They are not under those restrictions. Um, and other states have different guidelines. Mm -hmm. so, so it would be a lessening of the uh, restrictions of the guidelines in order for us to think about opening the schools yeah. for more we would, days. We would need Maine DOE to, um, to change their guidelines for spacing, social distancing in our schools. Yep. Thanks for that clarity. I think it's an important reminder uh, to the community. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Phil. No, thanks, Heather. Yeah, just very quickly, I just want to say this conversation is really helpful, and um, and we haven't had it publicly for a while, and I'd love to see it to continue. Um, I actually thought that was an excellent suggestion that some of the parents made, Dave Hughes and some others. Um, just this conversation itself, I think, is helpful, and we're, we're hearing some great uh, information from the nurses and some good questions from the board members and the public. Um, so I just, I would like to see this kind of update and maybe it's, we, we tackle different types of the, of the issue and the problem each month, but to, but to, but to put this on again and, um, and to continue to hear about this, I think, uh, just more information is always going to be better. Thank you for that, Phil. And I, I, um, I wasn't going to bring this up right now, but, um, one of the things we're also trying to do in the spirit of, uh, improving, uh, communication is to perhaps, um, create some documents that can be referred to on the website, like frequently FAQs or bullet points. Um, so, um, people are, are sending in questions. They're asking questions. They're good questions. We appreciate them. Um, it's all confusing, um, it's all frustrating. And so um, just to know that that is something that's happening in the background, though you're not seeing it right now, it is happening in the background. I also see that there are some people writing um, questions in the Q&A and hands raised and our policy right now, I know it might be frustrating is that this is time for the board because we do have a full agenda ahead of us. Um, but the nurses have said they're happy to answer questions. So if you do have a question, um, send it to the nurses, send it to the board. We'll do our best to, to get your answers. But um, we are gonna move on with the agenda at this point. Um, and I would just like to thank the nurses one more time for um, not just tonight and your amazing presentation that was full of information, but for all that you've been doing, um, you've just been hitting it out of the park. You're amazing. So thank you for keeping us all safe. Super appreciated. Moving on to principal reports, we will start with uh, Jason Mangerini's, our Pond Cove principal. Sure, thank you, Heather, and good evening, everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. So, actually, Kathy and and Troy and myself um, kind of have worked together on a presentation, uh, and I'm thinking, Kathy, that this is the appropriate time. Um, so Heather, if I, if we could, um, Troy and I both, both plan to speak about our schools, but as part of a, a data presentation with Kathy, is that okay? That's fine. Okay. So I'm, so I'm going to go That's ahead and go first. You I'll share my screen. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So you came in and out for a minute there, Jason. Is it you, Troy and Kathy speaking? Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, so can everybody see my screen because I'm okay. not able to see anybody anymore? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All I right. Can see it. Good. Okay. So um, it has been, as we are all painfully aware, uh, almost a year since instruction shifted as a result of the pandemic, and we are halfway through the current school year. So the two questions that we um, want to answer tonight, well, that we want to address tonight, um, how has the pandemic affected the learning of our students, and how can we optimize the learning for our students? 
So I want to start with the question, what does the NWEA data say? So as I think you're all, all aware, um, all of our students in grades one through eight take the NWEA in the fall and the spring. And what this graph is showing, these two graphs are showing, is observed growth from the fall of 2019 uh, to the fall of 2020 administrations, NWA administration, and the growth that was projected. Uh, projected growth is based um, on, by looking at um, all of the students in a particular grade at, who had the, the same RIT score, and that's what you see depicted on the y-axis, and who have had the same- um, the same amount of instructional time. And notably, the amount of instructional time was not adjusted for the pandemic. So this is the projected growth for students who took the NWA in the fall of 2019. So looking at what we see here then, we have math and we have reading at Con Cove grades uh, two, three, and four. And in, in the case of math, we are seeing um, that the observed growth um, is not what the growth was projected to be. Um, and the same is true in reading as well. Now, to know whether this is significant or not, we have to compare this data to prior years. And that's what this graph is showing us, this set of graphs. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is that these graphs are automatically generated by NWA. Um, and so the Y axis, we, we don't have a lot, we don't have any flexibility then. So the Y axis um, varies. So you just, when you're, when you're looking at the graph, you want to make sure that you're really only focused on the difference between observed growth and projected growth um, because the intervals do vary from graph to graph. So having said that, um, the, uh, the bar, the blue bar is the observed growth and the um, orange diamond is the projected growth. So let's start by looking at this year's second grade. Um, they are slightly below um, where they were projected to be, but it is less than a point. You can see in prior years, um, projected growth was well within observed growth. There is a large gap for our third graders. That might be a cause for concern. It may still be a cause for concern, but it's also worth noting that there is a gap every year um, for our third graders between observed growth and projected growth in, um, in the fall, from fall 2017 to fall 2018, it was a 10 point gap. In, uh, from fall 2018 to fall 2019, it was an eight point gap and then in from fall 2019 to fall 2020, it was a 10 point gap. Um, we believe that this gap is due to the fact that our first and second graders take the, um, the, the K2 test, while our third graders take the 2-5 test, the test for students in grades uh, two through five, um, and that the growth is projected based on that K2 test not the 2-5 test. Um, and that the 2-5 test is, even though it's an adaptive assessment, the 2-5 test is a, a harder test in that um, they, it's assessing more standards. It's assessing all the way up to fifth grade standards. So our, our students in the second grade in particular, our high performing students, they, they top out. Um, and so that's why we see that, um, that there is often um, a gap between observed growth and projected growth in the third grade, but then it's typically made up in the fourth grade. Um, and you see that, so like this year's fourth grade um, in the second grade, so fall 2017 to fall 2018, when they were in the second grade, their observed growth exceeded their projected growth. And then the following year, there was a gap between their observed growth and the projected growth. And then um, they've almost made that all the way up in the current year, even though what was being measured was 
um, three, mo three months of emergency remote learning followed by a, a summer slide and they still got within a couple of points of their projected growth. Okay, so that's math. Then in terms of reading, um, so let's start with the fourth grade. So this year's fourth grade. So when they were in second grade um, in the, so fall 2017 to fall 2018, they were one point below their projected growth. Uh, in third grade, they were six points below. Um, and at the start of this year, they were right where they were projected to be. Um, this year's third grade is three points off their projected growth, um, but that's actually less than last year's third graders um, were off. So what I find notable in this graph is the performance of our second graders, um, because in prior years, you can see that the gap there's no gap last year and then the year before it's a, it's a very small gap. Um, and we think that may reflect the fact that in kindergarten, first grade and second grade, the students are still learning to read rather than reading to learn as we say of students in grades three, three and above. Um, it's a skill reading that has to be explicitly taught for most students. Um, and the students who are currently in the second grade entered the period of emergency ro remote learning two thirds of the way through um, first grade. And so what we wanna see when the second graders take the NWA in the spring is some of that gap um, made up. That's what we are, that unfinished learning finish, that is what we are working toward. Okay, so now let's look at the middle school. Again, um, blue is our observed growth and orange is our projected growth. Um, I think the first thing that jumps out at me when I look at this is that observed growth is below projected growth in math at every grade level. Um, while, the, while in reading, the observed growth is higher than projected growth um, except in the seventh grade where the difference is, is arguably negligible. So about a quarter to a half a, half a writ point. So again, we wanna see whether this pattern is evident in, um, in prior years. So I'm gonna start with reading. So again, notice that the intervals um, on the white y axis differ from year to year. So we want to focus on observed growth versus projected growth. Um, the current fifth, sixth, and eighth graders, as you can see, have exceeded their projected growth. Um, and the sixth and eighth graders have actually improved their performance from the prior year. Um, so this year's eighth graders, when they took when they were in seventh grade, um, their projected growth was higher than their observed growth. Now, um, now they're even. Um, and, uh, and the same thing is true for the, um, the sixth graders. They were slightly below projected growth when they were in the fifth grade. And now they're, they're they, again, the, those are even. Um, the seventh graders are slightly below projected growth, but that's true in prior years as well. Um, and it gets made up. Um, uh, in the eighth grade or okay so yeah that was true from last year to this year okay then in terms of math so in math the story that the data appears to be the NWA data appears to be telling us is appears very different um, as mentioned observed growth is below projected growth in all four grades um, the drop in the sixth grade year is normal uh, based on, on prior years. Um, and as with that switch in tests from the second to the third grade, this also reflects the fact that in the sixth grade, students are taking the six plus test for the first time. And again, that gap is um, generally um, made up. Um, the, the drop in the fifth and the seventh grade um, is, is not normal. Um, and then when we look at this year's um, sixth, sixth to seventh, 
and seventh to eighth compared to prior years, um, it's hard not to see the effect of the pandemic. For example, if you look at the sixth grade in the fall of 2017 to fall of 2018, they were below projected growth, but then when they were in the seventh grade, observed growth shot up. Um, and um, the same thing was true moving from seventh to eighth, but not this year. So the question is, why might this be the case in math and not reading? Um, an article I read recently that I linked at the end of this presentation um, speculates that there are a couple of reasons because this phenomenon is not just true of Cape Elizabeth, it's being observed throughout the nation. Um, so one thing as with learning to read, um, math is almost always formally learned in school. Um, people don't wake up and all of a sudden one day know how to multiply fractions. That's something that has to be taught explicitly to them. Um, often students experience math anxiety and the broader stress and trauma that we're all experiencing as a result of the pandemic might be exacerbating that. Um, and then finally, it may be harder for teachers to challenge students, um, well, to, to engage them in effective um, instructional practices via remote, re, via remote platforms in math. So reflecting on this data, we can go in one of two directions or in both directions at once. Um, what are the reasons for us to be concerned um, about this data? Um, and, and what are some reasons why we feel like we've got this? Um, so in terms of reasons for concern, um, instruction is different. There's no question about that. We know we have less instructional time um, and both principals will be speaking to that um, in a few minutes. In kindergarten, two, kindergarten, first grade and second grade, as has already been mentioned, students are still learning to read. Um, that's a skill that like math has to be, has to be taught. And it's why our teachers in, at those grade levels are, are focusing on, on reading and writing and math. Um, we anticipate unfinished learning in the content areas. We have been focusing on skills and so there may be some content um, in science and social studies particularly that goes untaught this year or at least not taught to mastery. Um, and, then, um, and then we know that at this time when students are either learning 100% at home or um, partially at home that this situation can be exacerbating inequities and that everybody's home environment is different and um, we're not able to equalize those environments in the way that we can when everyone is coming to school mm -hmm. all of the time. So reasons why we maybe can take a deep breath um, and not freak out. Um, so one thing is that NWA data that I showed measured unfinished learning. It was fall to fall, so it measured the unfinished learning from that emergency remote learning period, which is three months, and then the summer slide, and not current instruction. So we have been in a hybrid model, although we, some of our students are, are doing that 100% remote, but most of our students are in the hybrid situation. Um, and so the spring data is gonna be really telling. We'll be able to see, um, it'll give us a very good picture, I think for next year, um, for where uh, where they stand. And again, our teachers have been focusing on, on skills. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that our middle school students took the NWA remotely. That was new for them. Um, with a different environment, could have impacted testing. Um, and um, and I, I had a, a teacher say to me and the students, when they took it in the fall, they were, they were out of practice. They had less stamina. And again, that might have impacted the results. Another reason why we got this, teachers are teachers, they're highly skilled, they know how to differentiate. And as I mentioned, they're, they're emphasizing skills, especially writing. Um, there are teachers who've said that they're actually um, assigning more writing and getting better project, that the technology lends itself to that. Um, our curriculum is spiraled. Again, I think we have some um, teacher feedback that's gonna address this, but um, Students learn something in the sixth grade in science, they learn it again in the seventh grade and again in the eighth grade at a, at a higher and deeper level, but it's an opportunity for teachers to address some of that unfinished learning. 
Um, and then another comment that's been made is that um, the in-person classes are smaller and there are fewer classroom management issues and in, with a smaller group of students um, can often move more quickly, more deeply um, through, through the curriculum. There's a reason why as a district, we prioritize small class sizes. And, and so we're, we're seeing the impact of that um, in this COVID environment in which we are instructing. Okay, I'm now gonna to defer to Principal Mangerides and Principal Eastman. Sure, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can hear me clearly now. Okay, so again, thanks again, Kathy, for that, um, for providing that overview of the data. Um, and um, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, the instructional changes that have taken place. As Kathy mentioned, this data measures um, particularly a year with three months of emergency learning and summer slide, um, given that it's fall data. And so we know that uh, when emergency learning first took place and, and the, the weeks after that, it was all brand new. Uh, we were figuring out um, how to work together and, and do this. And um, there was much, much room for improvement when we ended the year in June. Um, we had, uh, you know, it was really uh, all spring um, practicing previously taught skills, trying our best. Our teachers just worked so hard. Um, and by June, they were getting pretty good, but it was, it was a steep, steep learning curve. And so um, fewer school skills, much fewer skills were introduced in the spring of 2020 than, than we would have, have liked. Um, so, and since then, um, if we go to September 2021 to current, um, although, you know, we're definitely still, we want kids in school more and we want more face time with kids, we're not providing, we acknowledge we're not providing the educational experience that we would like. Um, we, the, our staff just continues to work tirelessly and just their, our teachers are amazing and they're constantly focused on improving and providing more opportunities for, for our students. And I, I couldn't be more proud of the, the teachers and the students and the staff uh, to see how far we've come. Um, th again, so many thanking the technology department. Uh, we, our teachers are well equipped now and can do a lot more and they've had a lot of training on um, the various you know, technology available to them. And we're, we now have FaceTime, right? With the hybrid model and students who are in fully remote have you know, four days of direct contact um, via Zoom. So lots of improvements that um, make me very optimistic um, that, um, you know, we can really look forward to those uh, spring NWA scores and our other assessments that we'll administer in the spring. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about Pond Cove in a minute and, and um, specifically around kind of content that we're covering, but I'm gonna let Troy address this slide first. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so um, pretty much exactly what Jason just said with, I guess, I think it's really, it was interesting going through this. It's really challenging to even think back and remember, you know, the spring because it's been a constant state of change. Um, but at the middle school, we did maroon and gold days, but they were based on subjects. So it was math on a maroon day. It was language arts on a gold day, things like that. Um, our school day ended early. We were, we were basically done by 1230 and teachers were largely doing a lot of check-ins with, with kids. Um, and I think it's really important to remember during that time, um, the pandemic was new to all of us. Um, there was no um, pandemic fatigue going on. And I think we were all just doing our best to keep contact with kids and make sure they stayed connected with school. Um, going into this year, uh, much different and taking a lot of information from feedback and surveys and things like that, it was really clear um, for middle school kids we want a lot of instruction, but at the same time, the fatigue of screen time on at home days. Um, and it was a real big concern for many parents. Um, so we built a schedule that would kind of support all of that. Uh, it's nice to have kids in person. We're able to 
make that face-to-face -face contact. A lot of our classrooms have between eight and 10 kids in them. They max out at 12. Um, but that, that really small class size and close contact has been beneficial. Um, and now we're moving goal by cohorts by students and we we're able to offer full remote learning for students. Uh, I think one thing that was a priority for us has been keeping the integrity of our, of our school and our schedule and still valuing um, things like band, phys ed, um, health classes, all of those things. We're still working to value those and, and keep them in students' minds as supports. Um, for some kids, that's a, a really important positive part of the day. And then kind of a new, a new class really has been the social emotional learning. Um, in some cases, that is a Zoom. And in some cases, it might be the newsletter that goes out, um, but it's a lot of effort being made to track and keep track of kids and between teachers and counselors working with, oh, I'm not seeing this student show up at my Zooms or this student you know, asked to speak with you. So there's a lot more going on um, in terms of that kind of support, I would say this year as well. So Kathy, if you wanna click, click us. Okay. So I hope it's okay. Troy and I are kind of going back and forth here, but I think it, it's logical in the way it's presented. Uh, so um, as far as, as feedback from teachers on how things are going, before I kind of share a little bit of that, um, um, just to give you a little background, go back, if we go back to summer 2020, so in preparing for this school year, the 2020-21 school year, over the summer, all grade level teams, K through four, worked on a revised curriculum scope and sequence. And so what I mean by that is uh, for every content area, reading, writing, science, social studies, um, how much will they, how much will they cover? In what order will they cover it? And so in also a timeline um, for um, when they will cover that material. So that's what I mean when I say scope and sequence and timeline. And so you need to remember these teachers were doing this, um, trying to anticipate an appropriate scope and sequence and timeline for a hybrid or fully remote program, which they had never experienced before. So uh, but they, they were up to the task. And uh, so they, they created that in the summer. And throughout the first They've been monitoring that and they discuss it at their team meetings and find out, you know, have we covered what we thought we would? Um, are we behind? Are we, are we doing well? Are we ahead? Uh, and so most recently at the end of the first semester, um, and this is, just goes back to last week, um, I asked teachers to really reflect on that, take, take some time and reflect on it and jot their thoughts down about each content area, reading, um, writing, math, science, and social studies, and kind of assess where, um, where we are with that scope and sequence. And I think in, in some places, um, we found that we're doing better than we thought. Um, and it's in some places where um, we are not covering quite as much as we had hoped. And I'll share a little bit of that. Um, but so if we go to the slide here, one thing that we've made clear upon COVE is that we're prioritizing writing and math. And that was from the beginning. And we, in the very beginning, we didn't know 100% for sure what that meant for social studies and science. But we knew that we were going to prioritize that scope and sequence and timeline. And we also knew that there would be bumps along the way um, that would prevent us from getting to some of those social studies and, and science um, concepts. Um, and that has played out. It's been true. So um, in general, and I'm going to give you a, a couple just to show you the level of detail that these teachers are working within. It's very impressive. Um, so in general, we're prioritizing reading, writing, and math. And all grade level teams reported that they were co will cover most or not all of the standards that they would cover in a typical year. Now, remember, right now, we're just talking about coverage of material, right? And then the real, pr the real the proof is in the pudding with assessments in the spring. But I mean, it's important that we think about what we're covering. So um, they're saying that they're, they're on track to, to cover most, if not all, of the standards in, in reading, writing, and math. Um, but fewer skills will be taught to mastery. 
And that just makes sense, right? We have less face time with kids, two days a week for hybrid. Um, and um, although teachers are connecting with students four days a week, fully remote, they have, there are a lot of barriers to being a fully remote teacher and not having those students right in front of you. So I wanna give you just a couple examples of reading, writing, and math from these teams that they gave me last week um, to show you the level of detail. So this is a comment um, from the grade four team as a whole um, for math. Um, while we will not get to geometry standards um, in some of the more advanced measurement conversions, um, we will be covering all other math standards close to the extent we would in a regular year. You know, so that's kind of the level of detail that we're working with. So when I see that, you know, we're gonna be, that's our goal. And we're going to be assessing as we get deeper into the spring and we'll know what we haven't covered and we'll be those fourth grade teachers will be able to communicate with fifth grade teachers at the middle school and tell them, this is what we've covered. This is what we've missed and we'll be in, you'll need to introduce next year. So right now it's looking like we're talking about geometry, right? And again, I'm talking about coverage, not mastery, but it's still, an, it's really important. So another example, um, so this is kindergarten math. The only learning target we may not report out on is I can represent subtraction to 10. Um, it is likely that we will not achieve the same level of mastery of skills, of many skills as in previous years. So, so they have a really good sense of their, their prioritizing reading, writing, math. They're covering quite a bit. And within that, they're prioritizing what they want to teach to mastery. And I think they're doing a great job. Um, I could go on for a long time about that. I'm just going to go to science. So science, um, most grade levels are, I've got the same examples as feedback from teachers. They're covering fewer topics in science or are not, and are not teaching topics to mastery. And we're not assessing science this year. Um, we're um, exposing, we're st you still go into classrooms and you see science experiments done in, in, in socially distant safe ways, but they're not teaching to mastery. Um, there just isn't the time, um, but the teachers, we're, we're comfortable um, with what we prioritized. Social studies, again, um, lots of social studies exposure through literature, but direct instruction and assessment of standards is not a priority for us right now. We're, we're gonna continue to prioritize um, reading, writing, and math. And that's, as Kathy mentioned, reading, you know, learning to read, um, with the assumption that that is, with the knowledge that that's more important right now, given the limited um, time we have with students. So I'm gonna stop there. All right, so um, what we have here, I've asked, I did much of the same. I asked, I've been asking all my teachers, mine are, these are really from the content leaders and or humanity teachers. Um, and it's very much similar to Jason. I think some of the difference is we actually have blocks in the day for science, blocks in the day for social studies built in equitably. So I believe we will still be covering the majority of our standards, um, maybe not quite to mastery or the level we would have, but that is the beauty of a spiraling curriculum. Um, you introduce topics, which in the same, I mean, it would be very challenging to say every student had the same level of mastery in any school year. Um, so I think there's going to be varying different, varying levels, especially during a pandemic. But um, really quickly, what the teachers are saying, um, I guess I can just read that because I'm not sure everybody can see it really well. But for example, um, the grade six humanities teachers, so language arts and social studies, social studies um, although some lessons or activities have been modified or omitted due to time constraints, um, we don't feel that there will be any huge gaps in learning that would interfere with our students' ability to enter grade seven English language arts or social studies courses. The beauty of humanities is that when students do an activity such as a DBQ, um, document-based questions is what that stands for, um, they are not only studying ancient civilizations, they're reading, writing, debating, and covering both ELA and social studies learning targets. Um, so I think that is kind of gets back to Kathy a while ago that said, kind of in the elementary school, they're learning to read and the middle school is really reading to learn. And I think that does show some of the differences in that uh, NWA data that Kathy shared. This next one is from the science content leader. So asking across all grades, just about science. And um, while the number of topics covered will be fewer than during an ordinary school year, 
All students will have exposure to and instruction in science practices, such as asking questions, defining problems, developing models, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing, interpreting data, as well as engaging in arguments based on evidence. As the science curriculum is a spiral, um, with each grade level building off the previous year's learning, each grade level will report to the grade level above on which specific content areas were introduced versus, versus covered. Um, and I think that means to mastery by the end of 2021 school year. Science teachers in the 21-22 school year will adapt to meet the students where they are and provide additional background as necessary to continue the learning. Um, so I think that's really good feedback. Um, one teacher gave me the quote of, it's kind of like basketball. Um, you know, you, you never, you're not gonna go out in a game and stop practicing your foul shots. You know, hopefully you've practiced them ahead of time. And then in the game is kind of your assessment for mastery a little bit. And that teacher's comment was, we, have, we are going to cover most and introduce most topics. What we're missing is some of the time for the guided practice to ensure the mastery. Um, but students will not go into the next grade blind and having never heard of things. Um, they may just may not have mastered them yet. Um, so I thought that was really helpful. So thank you, Kathy. OK, great. So. Uh, responses and next steps. And I know that that is um, what we're all, you know, we're all kind of concerned about and, and parents and teachers and administrators. And so um, we've listed some things here, um, but I, I wanna go back to, you know, the level of detail that, that our teachers are, the attention to detail. We have, you know, we have lists of, of um, skills that we have covered and skills that we anticipate that we will cover for the rest of the year. And we, so we will be um, using this information more than ever before, we'll be doing vertical planning in the spring. So um, typically at the end of a school year, um, you know, there are um, teachers are talking to, or the beginning of the next school year, teachers are talking to, um, the, the previous teachers are talking to next year's teachers about where their kids were at, but we're gonna to have to do a lot of that in the spring because um, we may not have covered everything and we students may not have mastered everything. So we're gonna be really um, looking at profiles of students and what they know and need to learn next and sharing those with next year's teachers. Uh, so we'll be spending more time doing that than typical. Um, we're, you know, we're prioritizing essential skills to be taught that we just definitely think that given limited time, we're definitely not going to miss out on the opportunity to teach skills. And that's primarily reading, writing, math. Um, we still, we, we maintain an active student support team process. Teachers are um, running into challenges um, and are having difficulty moving students forward. They can um, have discussions with colleagues and, and learn new ways to um, intervene and help support students. Uh, Dreambox, the district has pur purchased Dreambox, which is a dynamic um, math um, resource, uh, digital online resource. And so this is, teachers are really using it. The, the report, um, the Dreambox report shows that we're having um, a lot of success with, um, having teachers find the time to have students um, utilize Dreambox. And it's basically practice math skills. Um, and um, as the students answer questions correctly, it gets more and more challenging. So it moves with the students. So it's differentiated. Uh, we, we're maintaining to the best of our ability um, in person and remote um, tier two and three RTI support. So that's extra reading, right? It, reading and math support. Um, our permanent substitute that we have this year is um, really making a difference. Um, the substitute knows the students, knows the teachers and the classes. And when a teacher is absent, um, there's a much more seamless transition when that sub covers, because um, the sub is not becoming familiar. The sub, this, this permanent sub is, has worked, really knows the kids and knows the school. Um, a proposed addition to a math interventionist for next year, um, to the Pond Cove um, staff uh, would help address some of the concerns that we may have in, in unfinished learning and math. Uh, remote snow days is something else that the district is trying to, to so students continue learning even on a snow day. Um, and I just think that that um, could have some benefits for some students. Um, targeted social and emotional instruction, our second guidance counselor has been just 
just such a gift. Lots of students and families need support right now. So it couldn't have been more timely to have that position begin and an emphasis on vertical planning for next year. So that what I mean by that is at the end of this year, second grade teachers summarizing what they've taught and working with third grade teachers. So third grade teachers know where to start. Um, I'm going to stop there. Perfect. And mine are very similar to Jason's. Um, we also have a student support team that is working. Um, and that is typically a group of about four people that field kind of some concerns that teachers may have or parents may have for children um, that might need some more academic support. Typically that work is then doled out to two of our interventionists. However, those two interventionists this year are teaching a combined five, four or five classes um, of regular school, regular classes. Um, and that largely is to keep the class sizes down and to allow us to be back in, in person um, for the amount of days we are. So it's still there, still working. It's just, you know, been, it's reduced a little bit. Um, Allied Arts programming, we, I feel like has been, that has been very important for us to maintain. I think that is some strong connections for kids. Um, world language courses maintained. One thing that I believe CAPE is known for throughout the state, and I think it's for good reason, is our high quality world, world language courses. Um, and I think that it would be a shame to just all of a sudden not be doing those to gain extra reading or extra math at this point. Um, so I think it's important to keep the integrity of our programming across the board. Um, we have added some new courses um, for grades seven and eight. So uh, I know and I knew going into this that if there was an opportunity to create a course, we should do it. And if it could be in addition to and support current learning, so it's right now it's planning for success courses, which really takes a lot of the language arts um, skills, presenting, writing, um, and really puts those kind of to right on the spot and, and has kids working to demonstrate and apply their learning. Um, all students, it's not required that all students take it, but it is an opportunity in this time when people are concerned about the amount of time their kids are having in school. That is another opportunity that we tried to build in where we could. Um, without causing undue stress on students. So that's kind of in families, that's where we are. We also have the uh, um, SEL courses and, and monthly newsletters have been really strong and well-received. Uh, Jason has Dreambox. We right off quick um, purchased the Ascend math program, which is an online math program. It's not online, it's pre-recorded, but it's individualized. So really it's an attempt to help students to continue to develop their math skills. And with that, we, it really aligns nicely with our curriculum. So you can follow, I can tell you if students are on it, how long they spent on it, um, what their pre-assessment, where it put them at, what level, regardless if you're an algebra one kid, <laughs> maybe there, it's identified a gap back in adding fractions. You know, So you might be working on that independently to, to support your math skills. Um, we are now gonna be making a move to require people to use it. In the beginning, I had it there for people to look at um, and if they were interested in doing it, do it. However, I think now um, we realize there are gonna be some gaps and we feel like it's gonna be in math. Um, reading happens daily across the board. So one thing for next year's budget is a proposed position for one year uh, interventionist, which would be heavy math. Um, so it's my goal to have the most information we can about these kids and they're gonna get it through using the Ascend Math program. And, um, and it's so trackable that we will be able to really identify where kids are at and what they need. Um, so that's gonna be a new thing starting next, next semester is in school during their win, we're gonna request all kids and require them to do 30 minutes of Ascend um, to get them into that habit so we can track them. Um, we are also for next year exploring, well, for the rest of this year, exploring the potential for a three hour guided study hall. Um, for some students that may really be struggling and need that help. And it would be, um, if you're a maroon student, it would, it's potential it could happen on a gold day. Um, so that is, that's out there as a way we can try to add some supports for kids. And there'll be more information to come on that later. And I think the real key here is to provide in addition to um, intervention for classes. So in addition to means if a student is a little bit behind in math, we're not gonna pull them out of their math instruction to give them their supported math. We're gonna have them go to the regular math class and they have to, may have to not attend an allied art or something, um, but they're gonna get in addition to um, work, not in replacement of, I think that's really important. And then next year we're looking at scheduling both uh, double blocks um, for English 
language arts and math for next year. So to try to recapture some of that, that time. Thank you, Kathy. Great, thanks. Our last slide is just uh, some uh, links to resources, some resources that we've assembled. Um, in particular, I wanted to draw your attention to the last article that students respond to adult fixation on learning loss, which um, just provides a really interesting perspective on what we've been talking about. So, um, so a lot of information. We will post these slides um, to the website and um, invite anyone in the community with questions to contact um, any of us. We would be um, happy to speak um, in more depth or detail um, to any of the information that we shared. And of course, take questions from the board. Are there any questions? Elizabeth. First, I want to thank all three of you for that really, really um, useful and informative presentation. It, um, I know it was lengthy, but I really appreciated it. And um, I thank you for putting that time in to share that information with us. Um, it's interesting, the, the, the last link that you referred to, Kathy, is sort of something I've been thinking about ever since you said how has the pandemic affected the learning of our students? It's been rolling around in my mind because I think um, one thing I, I have noticed is that there, there are maybe all of us, maybe some of us, but you know, there is that, that fixation on the idea of learning loss and then the whole, and I haven't read the article, maybe this isn't what it says, but the idea that you know, a lot of our standards are sort of abstract constructs out there and, and we get to make some definitions of our own. And we also get to um, kind of celebrate that our children hopefully have survived a pandemic and have learned some other things. And so kind of just readjust how we're thinking because you know, standards were created. They weren't, um, they weren't given to us by some deity or something. They, they're, they're arbitrary. And so it, I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting that we ignore standards, that we, you know, throw everything away, but just kind of this um, willingness to shift thinking a little bit. So I'm going to go read that article and see if it says what I'm thinking. And so thank you. Cindy. Hi. Yes, thank you very much. This was a, it was very informative presentation and I, I appreciate all the effort that went into it and all the work you're, you're doing. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, I like how you're working together as well and um, showed, you know, shared what's happening at both Pond Cove and the middle school. I know you mentioned that um, Pond Cove students will be using a Dreambox math um, program and at the middle school, it's a send. So there are two different programs. Can you talk a little bit about are uh, you know is uh, are there similarities? What is the transition from using one program, one method, to another like for those students? And are there any plans to, you know, support rising fourth graders as they're um, you know as they move into fifth grade and perhaps some different methods uh, than what they've been used to? So both programs are new to us this year. Um, and uh, honestly, although um, Dreambox is a K-8 program, I don't know um, about Ascend, whether it can start in the elementary school, Troy, maybe you know the answer to that question, but um, uh, Jason and I were both familiar with Dreambox at the elementary school level, and Troy and Assistant Principal Mori were both familiar with Ascend at the middle school level. Um, but and we talked at the beginning of the year about whether we wanted to try to pick one, um, and then decided since both were pilots that we would try Dreambox at the elementary school and Ascend at the middle school, and then evaluate both programs and see which programs seem to work better for for students. Um, the plan is to continue with both programs in the respective schools next year. And so I think you make a really good point, Cindy, that we would want to make sure um, that our, our fourth graders entering um, the fifth grade and so moving from Dreambox to Ascend, um, that they're prepared for that. But I, I also want to emphasize, though, that 
neither Dreambox nor Ascend, I mean, these are tools. These are, this is not the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, I mean, the, the standards haven't changed. Um, and, and our fourth grade teachers are fully prepared to um, transition their students into the fifth grade to those fifth grade standards. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I don't know if I've addressed fully addressed your no, question. Or... That was, I just had one follow up. And so when you're saying you're going to look at both of them, evaluate, assess them, do you have a timeline for that? Like what period are you considering an assessment period? And there are certain, are there certain um, criteria you're establishing to um, assess one against the other? Uh, do you have a decision point in mind for that? I, I think we would, we, this is a really funky year. Um, and so we all agreed that we wanted another year of quote unquote normal school, you know, using these programs in the normal school year um, before we before we compare them. So that um, evaluative process will occur next year with an intent to make a, a decision one way or the other um, um, in terms of both programs in the following school year. So in the 22-23 school year. Yeah, and I would add really quickly that Ascend is a K-12 program, and I know that it goes up to TRIG. Um, I'm not exactly as familiar with the lower end of it, but the one of the, one of the reasons I, I was comfortable with Ascend, I'm not sure that Dreambox is as much, but Ascend can basically be a tutor. Um, you know, it is the tutor for somebody, so you're not gonna have to go out and hire a math tutor, um, and it can be used as that. It's, you, students take a self-assessment as long as they do it without the help of somebody. Um, it will place them relatively accurately where they're at. And if they spend their time watching the lessons that are prescribed for them specifically, um, and then they take the post-assessment, they can move on. And what we can, the trackability of Ascend is what is impressive. I've had parents say, oh, my son's been on it for this long and I can actually see the amount of time they've been on it. Um, I can see how much time they take on a lesson. Did they skip all the lessons and just go to the assessment? <laughs> um, you know, so we can see all of that level of detail, which for me, um, honestly, at Cape Elizabeth, a program like that wasn't needed as much in the past because a lot of our kids were really thriving kind of mathematically. Um, there still was a need for it, but not totally for all students. And I feel like right now that prescription, that level of specificity around what standards kids have mastered and what ones they have not is really important as we start to go into the summer and into next year. Um, for placements and, and actually programming design and what do we need or where are those gaps. So that that really is the rationale behind why I, I did that one. And I'm not familiar with Dreambox as much, but I know that's there. Oh, and students will have access to Ascend all summer as well. <laughs> little little plug there. Uh, so, so I think that's something that could be helpful. Thanks, Troy. Kimberly, you can unmute. Thank you. Um, thank all three of you. That was a, a great um, presentation, very thorough, and um, answered a lot of the questions I've had. Um, and I had, um, and I appreciate also your um, forward thinkingness in um, requesting a interventionist um, in the budget for next year. Um, and I just had, I had um, a question for Kathy and a question for Troy. Um, Kathy, um, looking at the third grade um, testing results, um, I felt initially alarmed. I think you had a plausible hypothesis and I just was curious how certain we are that that is the reason for the dip in third grade um, and making sure that we're not uh, you know, maybe missing something else. Um, and Troy, I was curious, um, you mentioned double blocks um, for um, I think math and ELA for next year. And I was just curious um, uh, where the time is coming from, if there's something else that's um, being impacted and if so, what? Thank you. I'll go first because I, I already know my answer. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, we have, um, again, that's, that is a thought in some ways it may be a dream, but right now the early planning stages, um, we currently have wind for five days a week. Um, 
you know, there's an opportunity to take two win periods for language arts, two wins periods for math, and still have one win period to be used, you know, the way we typically do. Of course, there are hurdles with that because that's one of the only times band can meet, you know, and we're on a six day rotation. So there are some other pieces that we have to put into this puzzle and make it work. Um, but I, I think there's a real value in doing this. Um, the other thing that could happen for language arts is maybe not the need for a double block because we have moved to the humanities approach. So the DBQ thing was a great example. And I, I know that most people may not know that, but it's document-based questioning. So students read a document, they have to pull from the information, they have to write a response. Um, so that is a social studies skill, but it's being taught largely in a language art through the language art standards. So those opportunities may just be increased for language arts and math may be the double block target that we're hitting. Um, another really cool thing, and I'm sorry to prolong all this, but um, we have added some nice things during this pandemic. And one has been, um, we get rid of not knowing the pandemic was coming. We canceled the seven, eight math class, which traditionally has been a very challenging math class, I think throughout the whole district. Um, and we were just planning to teach it, keep our groups heterogeneous largely and um, add a few extra eighth grade standards so that students would not be you know, held back from joining algebra one. Obviously that got thrown a loop a little bit but Mr. Hogovic has worked with the math team and now we're offering a seven plus for families and 33 families have signed up for it. They are taking it on Wednesdays for an hour every Wednesday to get those extra standards in so that those students can still go to algebra one next year. So there's a lot of creative things going on in our schools right now that, I, that I'm pretty proud of. And in terms of your other question, um, that pattern of scores dropping from the second to the third grade because of the change from the K2 test to the 2-5 test, and then from fifth to sixth grade because of the change from the 2-5 test to the six plus test um, has been widely observed um, and particularly in high performing school districts because again, the students just top out in that last year of the assessment. So in the second grade, in the fifth grade, um, and it, it's a pattern that's been observed to such an extent that it's actually taught in graduate level courses on the teaching of mathematics, particularly. So the, the key is, is that made up? Do we, and we saw that. We saw that in most years, not this year at the, you know, at the middle school, you know, fall to fall, but we'll see what fall to spring data shows, but, um, which I think we can attribute to the pandemic, but but typically you do see the the it'll look like your sixth graders are failing, and everybody gets alarmed, um, and then they take the the test the next time they take the assessment, either in the spring of the sixth grade year or in the fall of the seventh grade, they're right where they should be. Same same for spring of third and fall of fourth. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate both your responses. And, um, and I, um, I also I, I appreciate and admire the nimbleness with which you're um, handling this year and making improvements um, as, as you go along. So thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, Jeff. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of cover the same topic, but I'm going to cover the different topic first. I don't, I am not going to have the same kind of data analysis that you've heard from Pond Cove in the middle school, primarily because the comparable assessment to the NWEA that we use is the PSAT, uh, which we just administered last month and do not have results for yet. Um, so if the board is interested in a comparable presentation about high school gaps um, and sort of looking at the specifics of those concerns, I'm hopeful that perhaps I could have it in time for the March meeting. Um, it, it just, it simply depends when the results come in. They'll probably come in either late February or early March sometime um, based on their original timeline. So I will comment on gaps and thoughts and, and concerns but they're a little bit more speculative and anecdotal than you've seen so far uh, in terms of Pond Cove in the middle school. But first I'd like to address uh, another issue and that is our program of studies. Our goal was in a regular year to have the program of studies to you a week or two ago, 
and then have the board have the opportunity to review that program of studies um, this year. And I think if it wasn't, or this month, and if it wasn't for the pandemic, I think we would have made it. Um, the reason we are delayed is a reason that we're excited about. Um, and Kathy in particular has been putting in a lot of work um, on this project. And that is to make our program of studies more of a live document. So this year, when you see the document, you will see for every course name, the course will be the course name will be a link and it will allow parents and families and obviously board members to click the link and go and see a, a, a syllabus uh, that sort of outlines the course in a little bit more depth than we've been able to do in the past. And we've been making a lot of progress in pulling that together. I think we're still sort of a handful of courses short um, in, 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 but I'm, I definitely will be able to do, get it complete within the next uh, week to 10 days or so and be able to get you the program of studies in plenty of time. But I'm gonna make a request if the board would indulge me, if you'd be willing to say, it's okay to go ahead with the course selection process. Um, as long as I tell you all the changes you're gonna see in the program of studies uh, when you see the program of studies. Um, and I just wanted to quickly summarize what those changes are for you. And the first one is, and this one is really not new, but it's, it's we're trying to emphasize it even more, um, that in addition to the opportunity for students to go to the Portland Arts and Technology High School, um, uh, we have also, last year we researched and this year we uh, began a partnership with the Westbrook Vocational Program. Um, we, at one point, we thought we were gonna have three to five students going there. We actually only have a single pioneer students. I'm hoping we're gonna be in the three to five range next year. Um, and basically students will have the opportunity to take an, in Westbrook courses that are not also offered at paths. In other words, if there's a course that's offered at paths, our students will need to go there. If it's not something offered at paths, then they would have an opportunity to take those programs at Westbrook. Um, and they've got some really cool programs there. They've got firefighting, they've got EMT training, they've got electricity, they've got commercial truck driving, trucker's license, which is what our one student who's involved at Westbrook is taking right now. Um, and then they have criminal justice and they've got a social services program as well. Um, so the introduction of the program of studies, we'll be talking about that. And then towards the end of the program of studies, all of those courses, opportunities at, at Westbrook will be listed. So we're excited about that. Um, we are offering a new course um, that will be called Music Technology. Um, it's a course, actually, Mr. Wheeler, Rob Wheeler, who you saw earlier, introduced the Allstate Students and Band. He has a master's degree, actually, in music technology. He has taught a course in music technology in previous schools. Um, and we're going to take advantage of his expertise. And I think it'll be a an interesting course because you don't need to necessarily have any expertise in any particular instrument uh, to be able to participate in the music technology course, but it's basically exploring how music is created through technology, giving students actual experience with doing that, um, which in a level which is beyond uh, garage band. Um, and there's other more sophisticated tools that they're gonna be using um, than that. So we're excited about that. We're excited about a semester art offering that when you get the program of studies, you will see it's called Celebrating Diversity Through the Arts. Um, and it's going to be primarily taught by one of our visual arts teachers um, with a significant assist uh, from Rob Wheeler, our music teacher. And basically the purpose of that is to, is to take a deeper dive than we are able to do in our regular curriculum into um, art, art, the creation of art by people and artists of diverse backgrounds, diverse backgrounds by race, diverse backgrounds by ethnicity. Um, so they'll be looking at art created by black artists and Latino artists and Native American artists and, and other groups as well. Um, and it is gonna be a collaboration. I suspect it will be, I think over the next couple of years, we'll see some other courses with that sort of, uh, uh, bent or that sort of focus coming into the high school curriculum. And this is the first, this is our pilot course in that. So I think we're really excited about that. Um, 
There were two changes we're making to encourage more students to take computer programming. One is that we are offering math credit for computer programming. We are encouraging students to take computer programming for math credit in addition to a regular math credit, math, one of our regular math courses as well. And the other thing we were doing, and I think I mentioned it to the board at a previous meeting, is we are experimenting with an off lab um, computer programming experience slash course um, for freshmen to take in the in in the off lab days when they're taking their physics lab classes. Otherwise, that will mean something to high school parents, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it if folks have any questions about it. But uh, I, I that's two ways in which we're trying to expand an already expanding program. Um, and the last thing that you'll see is that our architectural design class. Um, will, is explicitly being described as a CAD offered class. In other words, Mr. Ray will be teaching using the primary tool of CAD as his instructional vehicle, which I think um, will, be a, will be a great shift. So that's program of studies. Um, I'm thinking I'll just keep on going and then have questions at the end with, all right, so let me get into unfinished learning. Um, um, we, have, we did do the, the PSATs for students in grades 10 and 11 in January, and I will, am expecting we'll get results. And I just say again, I'd be happy to, as soon as I get at least a, two or three days after the results come in to do an analysis of the results, I, I'd, I'd be glad to present at either the, the March board meeting or, or whatever works best for the board. Um, I, I've had lots of conversations with teachers in terms of sort of say, asking them anecdotally, how much of the typical course content do they expect that they will cover based on the pace that they're setting this year by the time they get to the end of the year? Um, and the answers vary a little bit depending on the course, depending on the level of the course, and, the, and depending on the grade level of the students. In, in general, I would say the courses that are being taught to students who are older they're covering a higher percentage, but the percentages I'm hearing are anywhere between 60 and 90%. Um, and I think the, the mid range is probably in the 65 to 80% range, roughly, probably maybe, maybe 65 to 70%, 75% range. Um, I would say that there is more sacrificing of course content. In other words, some knowledge issues, particularly where that, knowledge or that course content, the stuff of the course is not directly related to what's going to be coming in the next school year uh, with the next course in sequence. Um, I think everybody is going into a little bit less depth on topics that are less connected to what comes next. Um, I will say the skills coverage is probably on the higher end of that 65 to 90 percent. So reading, writing, those sorts of things. Teachers certainly recognize that those are our those are our graduation learning targets. Those are the key things that we want kids to be able to um, to, to be learning constantly. Um, so I will say, echoing what Jason and Troy said, is my big my hunch is that when we do get the data, the bigger concern will be, as it is in the other two schools, will be in math only because as Kathy well explained, kids learn math in math class. Um, to some extent they can learn, particularly in physics, they can learn some math in physics class, but for the most part, that's their shot at learning math. Um, whereas reading and writing skills are more embedded across the curriculum. Um, so my suspicion is that we will find, particularly among certain grades and certain levels of classes, a bigger gap in math, which is, one of the reasons why I have also proposed through the budget a one-year math science position to help us close that gap. Um, the opportunities in the high school um, to close that gap um, are, and these are not set in stone, but the things that are topics that are, uh, I think are worth exploring is number one, the possibility of doing a, a program before school begins uh, for maybe a couple of weeks to do a sort of quick injection based on identified needs. I think there is another opportunity making 
even better advantage, taking even better advantage of our achievement period um, where we've identified students who are struggling. And I do think, I do suspect that the two grade levels that will be the most impacted um, next year in the high school will be the ninth grade and the 10th grade. Um, that's just a hunch I have, um, and, I, and I would suspect that it's probably right. And the interesting thing about that, and I do not have a program to unfold to you today, I can, but I only have the concept that those, the ninth grade and the 10th grade also happen to be the years that also have extra lab periods one semester of the year, and they have off lab days. So that creates an opportunity to, to add some additional exposure to math, particularly as it's embedded and in, integrated in science in the high school schedule without taking students out of anything else that's really important. So that's, that's an, an interesting, I think, opportunity for us. And, it's, and, and I, I think it's gonna be more closely explored. Um, I will say that I've, you know, we've had some kind of the math department um, and science teachers have already begun discussions with the eighth grade teachers. Um, and we did hear as Troy reported, and I think Kathy mentioned as well, that in some cases, the math teachers think they're doing pretty well in terms of coverage, largely less, there's less of a gap than they probably expected at the beginning of the year, largely because of the much smaller class sizes. Um, so we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed about that. Um, I will say in terms of, we do track, very, we've always tracked really carefully the students who are failing and getting low grades in classes. And what we are noticing is that there is not a significant difference um, this year compared to previous years. It's a fairly typical um, sort of students who need more support and more time and that sort of thing. Um, so that's my report on that. And then I just had, Two other things I wanted to mention and then any questions that anybody has first, I wanted to, to sort of fill in um, Joe's report about Model UN. I just wanted to share the names of three, st three students who went to the Boston University Model UN, the virtual experience. Um, and the three students who won uh, prestigious awards were Sophia Toon, uh, who won for a best position paper. Um, and it's actually notable because it's a good accomplishment, but it's also notable because it's also the very first Model UN conference that she attended. So that was Sophia Toon. Um, Ella Bryman um, also won a best position paper uh, for representing the United States in the United Nations Security Council. Um, and lastly, junior Claire McDonald um, in her first ever crisis committee represented John Il Ho in the DPRK cabinet following the untimely death simulated death of Kim Jong-il. And in typical Claire fashion, Ms. Oliver says she won best delegate honors. So she was a student that Joey was referring to got the best delegate honors, which I think is the highest honor that you can get. Um, and the last thing that I wanna mention that I'm really excited about is our ventilation systems in the high school are already being upgraded. Uh, the last, well, all this week, all this week, um, some of the newer ven unit ventilators in the high school are being retrofitted with UV light filters so that all the recirculated air that goes through the unit ventilators um, hit a, bar a UV light barrier, uh, which science and engineering tells us is, is it capable of killing coronavirus and other germs. Um, starting in mid-March um, or early to mid-March, uh, we are going to have many older unit ventilators in the high school replaced with newer unit ventilators, which will have two systems uh, for killing coronavirus and other germs. And one is that very same UV light system. Um, and the other is the unit ventilators will be stronger and more powerful to begin with. And they're capable of handling MERV 13 filters, which are sort of the state of the art um, quality of filter for filtering out um, germs and, and things. So we're really excited about that. And I'm super appreciative to the school board and to Marcy and to Donna who worked really hard to put that together and parry that proposal and the school board for recognizing how, we do, how important it is. So I think we're as a district spending roughly $600,000 on that ventilation upgrade. So it's, 
it's a really, really important and valuable and much appreciated step. Um, and that is my report. Thank you, Jeff. Are there questions? Okay. Um, so then, Marcy, we are going to go ahead. Yes, hi everyone. And thank you, Jeff. That's a good segue into my presentation tonight. Um, for the next few weeks, I will be focusing on all of the final invoicing for the coronavirus grant money that we received. So all of the ventilation project invoices, I'll be invoicing that to the state to get our money retrieved that we've been granted through our grant. So we're very excited. Um, we will be uh, diving deep into full budget analysis now that we have um, our budget process moving um, this winter and spring, um, I would like, to, I, my goal is to really dive deep into um, doing some budget analysis and um, good visuals for you all to have. For our monthly financial report, um, the percentage of the year that has occurred as of January 31st is 58% of the year. So right now at this point, the total general fund expenditures that we have has come to 52% at this time. The average percentage spent at this time for the past five years is 55% spent. So we are three points below the average of spending patterns at this time. The range that we've been monitoring for, for this year have been um, for every month, a three point range. Last month was a four point range below the normal spending pattern and now we're at a six point. Um, however, we are um, monitoring closely the areas of our substitute spending. We predict that that will be something that we will wanna manage and have going forward to get us through the rest of the year. So we're, we're monitoring that closely as um, Jason had mentioned, the coronavirus relief grant money provided the full-time substitute at Pond Cove. And we are trying to continue that as much as we can from month to month basis of analyzing our expenses. So that's where we're putting our focus right now to get us through the finish line to the end of the year with um, maintaining our expense, expenditures within our budget. And I would just like to do a quick shout out to our food services, our nutrition um, staff, uh, Peter Esposito and Robin Taylor just received a grant from Full Plates Full Potential for $5,000 to help with the school nutrition program. And I just want to tell you that the school board and Superintendent Wolfram received a thank you from Full Plates Full Potential, and they thanked you all for continuing your efforts in feeding the children. And that concludes my report, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Marcy. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Dell, our Director of Special Services, Del Thank you, Heather. Thank you for hanging in with us. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, tonight, I just want to share with the board um, some recent developments at the main DOE that occurred since the last time we've had a regular business meeting. And that has to do with the student age out date age, I should say, in the sense that, um, so just to back up a bit, um, for those that you, of you that may not know, um, in the past, we have had students that for various reasons required additional years at the high school. And as long as they had not received their diploma, um, were, and was it was done on an individual basis, and this is a very small number of students, but, um, in the years that I've been here, we've had students every year that have had additional years. And uh, that was generally capped at the year that they would turn 20. And the uh, main DOE has recently changed that from 20 to 22. And um, they also changed that it's not the year that they turn 22, it's the actual day they turn 22. So for a student who turns 22 in October, that would be their last day of school. 
and they would be considered done and finished and aged out at that time. Um, but uh, the reason I'm bringing this up and sharing it is um, possible budget implications down the road. So a typical student in the, the way it was done prior might have a potential of two additional years with us um, for a total of six years at the high school. Um, in this current model, it could potentially be eight years. And um, of course, each and every um, uh, decision that would be made would be based on students' needs and what's in the best interest of the student. And uh, that it, we would make sure that what would that programming look like? This isn't about just stretching seat time. It would be about appropriate and relevant programming for those students. And it um, going forward may look very different than things we've done in the past because we'll be working with older students. Uh, DOE is still ironing out some of the legal pieces of this. But again, I, need, I just wanted to update the board because uh, down the road, this may uh, certainly have budget implications with regard to support staff that we need to support these uh, individuals. Um, and the other, the, uh, what I've been told by DOE is on the other end. So we could potentially be stretched in, on that end with regard to the age of students that we need to support. And at the same time, they're working on the three and four year olds coming on board as well. But I, did, I was told that unlike just getting an administrative letter that says this is in effect as of now, that that will be done in a uh, gradual process and uh, should not be done sooner than the next two to three years. And that's uh, assuming uh, responsibility for the three and four year olds with regard to their special education needs. Any questions? Cindy? I doubt. They're important updates. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, when does the new age cap, the upper end, take effect? Is that an immediate? So it's immediately for, for this year's students that would have normally aged out. Mm -hmm. um, DOE uh, requested that we reach out to those families and let them know that this is an option. Okay. And that has been done. And that was question two, is there going to be a process to review the current IEPs and transition plans to get an estimate of, you know, who would be in that, could potentially be in that group and the impact of it? So the families that it would impact this year, as in the students that would have aged out this year, they have been told that that is an option for them. And so again, that's being done on an individual basis through IEP meetings. And then our younger students, um, that will come up at their uh, annual IEP meetings and be discussed at that time. Thank you. A great question. Thank you. Any other questions? And that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you, Heather. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, and now we're on to Superintendent Wolfram. So before I start on the calendar, I just want to thank our administrators, I think you've heard tonight, not only are they leading their staffs and students and meeting the challenges of the pandemic, but they're also thinking forward to how to make things better, adding new programs, supporting their students and their staff. And I just, I think it's amazing. And I, I've just been so impressed by, um, I, I've, heard this really before, but it's just so impressive, I think, um, sitting here listening to it again in this format. So I just want to thank everybody for all their work that they've done um, throughout this challenging, very challenging time. So tonight I'm bringing you the calendar, uh, the proposed calendar for 2021-22. And we are we, along with the other superintendents in Cumberland County, are um, being optimistic and looking at a calendar that brings everyone back to school full time. So that's the promise that this calendar is based on. Um, you'll remember from last year and the years before that um, those sending districts to PAS, um, the superintendents have to get together and talk about days off, um, 
professional development days, when students are in school, because throughout all of the uh, sending districts to paths, we can only have, um, we can have no more than five dissimilar days. Um, so that it really ensures the students who are going to paths um, that they have similar educational experiences. So um, we get together and, and sort of negotiate our days and talk about our calendars and um, what are days that um, are non-negotiable and days that are negotiable. So, um, and then our calendar committee got together and looked at um, the proposal and um, we'll, and discussed um, the in-service days prior to the start of school. So, um, so the scheduled start of school date um, would be the first of September. Um, typically, we we have an in-service day on November or uh, on election day, which is this year is November second. Um, due to the voting that's going on at the high school. And um, there, there was a suggestion that we, we take this as a remote day um, in preparation for snow days that might be coming or remote days that we might be going into. And that would then not be counted as, a, um, as one of those five dissimilar days because none of the other districts have that day off. Um, Indigenous Peoples Day is um, on a Friday, um, so uh, sorry, it's on a on a Thursday. So rather than go to school, on, yeah, rather than go to school on Thursday uh, or have off on Thursday and then go have to go back to school on Friday, we all decided that it made sense to have a long weekend. Um, I think our staffs are all going to need, and and our families are all going to need a long weekend at that point. And March 11th is um, typically an in-service day for most of the Cumberland County school districts. And in fact, um, GSEA, which is our regional service center, has been um, for the last several years, and it won't happen this year, um, holding uh, regional in-service uh, opportunities for our teachers where um, say the music teachers um, in our region can all get together and, and uh, have professional development that's specific to music and our, our science teachers and our social studies teachers. So, um, so there's a proposal that um, our in-service day be planned for uh, March 11th. So the uh, school calendar needs to come to the school board for approval. So you'll be um, voting on that in a bit. And I, I do recommend that you will approve the, that calendar uh, later, the proposal later this evening. Uh, but for the budget update, we continue to work on the budget and we have gotten some good news. Um, I think I've reported to you that we are getting uh, an increase of approximately $6,000 in our state subsidy, which um, we are thankful for, as we were expecting probably a cut. So that is good news. We also received word that our, um, our uh, retirement um, the amount that we pay into retirement has been reduced. Um, so that will have a significant impact on our budget. And um, there has been, um, we, we have, we require our teachers to um, apply for course reimbursements and we have had a reduction in that um, this year. So um, we started out at a 7.4% increase budget and now we're down to a 7.18 and um, there has been a uh, reduction of almost $62,000 so far. So um, that's where we are right now. Um, and a reminder that we, we hope to have a reduction in our health insurance um, increase, but we won't know that until April. Um, about the recent move to remote learning at Pond Cove and Cape Elizabeth Middle School for this week. Um, it has been due to staffing challenges. I, I think you heard tonight and we did, we have said all along that, that staffing challenges will be um, probably reasons that we have had to move to remote. 
Um, it didn't, just to calm people's fears, uh, it did not involve any students testing positive, but um, it did involve some quarantining of staff. And again, we do look at those situations um, on a case by case situation and uh, try to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions. And um, at this point, um, for the safety of our students and our staff, a decision, we made the decision. I made the decision. Uh, we made the decision as a team, really, um, uh, to have to move to remote for um, Pond Cove in the middle school. Uh, the blessing in that is that next week is vacation, so it didn't have to be two weeks. Um, we only had to look at a one week switch. So we're, uh, if we have to think about timing, it was fairly good timing for that to happen. We know that um, parents are anxious to get their students back to school full time. We are anxious to get our students back uh, to school full time. But as you heard tonight, again, we do have to follow Maine CDC and Maine DOE guidelines. And included in those guidelines, as Karen said earlier, are mask wearing and social distancing. And we are limited by the size of our classrooms and the R staffing. So we, we are all working on this. We're looking forward to the day when we can get our students back in. Um, we are working on the ventilation pro, uh, projects, um, as Jeff said, and I'm thank you, Jeff, for explaining all those different uh, phases of the project because they're very technical. Um, but there are many things that um, we're doing at the high school and that those projects will move into the middle school in Pond Cove. I know people are saying, why couldn't they do the work during vacation? But we have been working with a, uh, a contractor to do this work and they are on, they don't follow the school schedule necessarily. They are trying to work with us on um, our Wednesdays and trying to schedule as much of the work as possible on Wednesdays when our students aren't in the building. Um, but we are putting the safety of our students and staff, you know, at the top of our, our priority list so that um, our, our schools can be safe for our students and our staff. And we are so appreciative of the, um, the COVID money that has come from the federal government that allows us, as Jeff said, it's $600,000. So um, that's where we are right now. And we will continue to um, work to get our students back in the school. Any questions? Jen, go ahead, Jen. Hi, Jen. I just wanted to quote, uh, clarify one thing when you were talking about the calendar and Indigenous People Day. I think you might've actually met Veterans Day is on oh, Thursday, yes, November 11th. Yes, sorry, yes. That's I just wanted to clarify for anybody who yeah. was. Thank you, thank you. Kimberly. I, um, I just wondered if you might just speak to the professional development days. I, we had had um, for a couple years, we'd piloted shorter days um, more regularly and um, this year it's all a little bit moot with the remote learning. So I, I don't know if you could just speak to kind of where we're at with professional uh, development. We, we do actually continue to follow the schedule with those um, half day Wednesdays. Um, and yeah, we, I meant more moot we, for the families because- yeah, Right, right, right. In, in our world, we are still following that. Right, yes. No, and I, do have, we, uh, it has been successful. People have been, uh, staff have been happy to have a longer, um, a longer period of time to really delve into the work. Um, we just actually did a three hour training um, in diversity that was amazing um, uh, last Wednesday. So we are planning on continuing that and we do have those on the schedule in yellow, um, the same number of half days. So that has been a very, very successful um, use of that time, so. Perfect. Thank you for the update. And I um and I recognize you've been working very hard on the professional development days and there's been a lot of good work happening. I, I just meant that for the families it hasn't been impacting yeah. the schedule so much this year. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you for that update, Donna. Uh, new business. May I have a motion, please? 
I move we approve go the ahead, following. Go. Oh, go ahead. No, you go, Laura. I move we approve uh, the following athletic nominations. Um, Alpine head coach at Cape Elizabeth High School, Courtney Watson. Second. Any comments or questions? Okay, voting. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfried. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Great. May I have a motion, please? Go, oh, Laura. Oh, I was going to say, Elizabeth, this one's your turn. I'm just trying um, to expedite. I, we, I, I move we approve um, the calendar, 2021-22 uh, 20, calendar. I have a second. Second. All right. Uh, is there any further discussion? Um, I was a part of those meetings. I thought they were thoughtful. Um, there were teachers involved. There were some administrators involved. Um, I think I heard Donna mention it, but um, you know, there was some teacher input through a survey. Um, we don't have a ton of wiggle room uh, because of the paths and the no more than five dissimilar days. Um, so I think it is a good calendar uh, and I will definitely vote for it. Is there any, are there any other discussions or comments or questions? I just wanna say that um, I think it's a, a really neat use of our um, expanded understanding of remote learning to instead of give that November 2nd yeah. off to change it to a, a remote learning day. I think that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for that. Okay, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfried. Yay. Um, Cindy Bolt. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, may I have a motion please? I move we approve policy JICJ, which refers to student use of cell phones and other electronic devices. I have a second. Second. Uh, oh, Elizabeth, as policy chair, can you speak to this for a moment? Sure. So this is a second reading. You should have seen the first version last month. And um, there really was just a little tinkering with wording. Um, the essence of the policy that we brought to the board last month has not changed. And um, what really is established in this policy is the ability for administrators to establish rules and um, guidelines for their own schools that are age appropriate and um, are however restrictive need to happen at their schools and teachers also in their own classrooms, given the um, freedom to establish the regulations that they need for um, cell phones and electronic devices. The one thing that the board and everybody participating in policy committee felt really strongly about was um, cameras and camera phones because it, almost everybody is carrying around a camera these days. And so if you look at B, that um, we're really coming down very strongly around prohibited areas where cameras may be used and um, asking that care should be taken in other locations to respect the privacy. Not everybody necessarily wants to have their picture taken um, and that sort of thing. So while we're really strong about those private areas, we're also asking for care to be taken. Um, but otherwise it really refers to um, cheating, violations of student code of conduct, um, and you know that the devices may be confiscated and that sort of thing, but we're trying really hard to allow the principals to be able to establish um, rules that make sense for their own populations because what makes sense at the high school isn't the same as what makes sense at Ponco. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. Are there any questions? Okay. So voting, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. 
Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Cypress. Yay. Cindy Vault. Yay. Jen McVay. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, so the added um, vote, may I have a motion or agenda you know, item? I'm talking tonight, but I'm gonna go for it. So yeah. um, I move that we expand the definition of our interview committee for the superintendent search. May I have a second? Second. Um, okay, so Elizabeth, would you like to speak to this or would you like me to? Go ahead. I'm happy to. So um, because we voted on the makeup of our interview committee back in an earlier business meeting, um, we need to bring this back to the board because um, the Kimberly, Heather and Elizabeth, you know, superintendent search committee thought about it a little more and there may be um, reasons why we need to allow in particular um, more than one building administrator. And um, as we were thinking about it, we would prefer to just say at least one building minute administrator per school. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that we have a very knowledgeable and engaged retiring building principal at the high school, but we also have a very knowledgeable and engaged assistant principal at the high school. And we didn't want to limit the participation of anybody in that because we're in that sort of unusual situation we would like to kind of make that available so we're asking to amend the definition to um, not we're not changing anything else but just instead of one building administrator per building we would like it to say at least one and that's really all it's about any questions Okay, thank you for that explanation, Elizabeth. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolt. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, so Elizabeth, you get to keep on talking. Policy. So um, we're bringing to the board um, a couple of policies for first read, which means they're, um, they're not being voted on tonight. So the first policy is IMB, which is teaching about controversial issues. And um, it just felt like it was time to review this policy. Um, at this time, um, you can, if you're looking at your policy, you'll see some red line. What we do in policy committee is we take, um, if we have a, a policy that's already been established like this one, um, we also get policy samples from Main School Management Association, which has a legal department. And then we um, get a policy sample from Drummond and Woodsum, who are our legal um, advisors. And we try to see, okay, you know, what are the updates that these different entities um, recommend to us. And what we found is that our, this particular policy is really pretty darn close to the MSMA sample. Um, and what we really need to do is we're honing in on um, making sure that discussion of controversial issues is appropriate to the age, grade and maturity of the students involved, but that we recognize that the ability to um, have these discussions is really important to the education of our students. Um, and that the study is really objective and scholarly. We're not really trying to push opinion, but um, have a maximum emphasis on facts and critical thinking as a part of the educational process in our schools. So um, there, there's a cross-reference. I think the only reason that IMBB is in the packet tonight is because it's cross-reference from um, teaching about controversial issues and that policy is around the accommodation of sincere beliefs in required instruction. And that just has to do with if, if, there's, a, if there's a particular subject that is um, really contradictory to a family's very sincerely held beliefs that you know, there's a way to have that conversation with administration and teachers and, and figure out um, a, a different path for a student perhaps if that's not 
you know, a comfortable and appropriate. So that's that policy. And then um, oddly to some of you, but um, I, I think everybody's gonna understand <laughs> um, a policy that we are establishing for ourselves, um, which is the annual budget process procedures. So we already had um, a policy in our manual that just establishes, you know, what we have to do as far as budgeting. But over um, my nine years on this board, uh, and, and I think through several different superintendents and business managers and that sort of thing, we have now come to what has been a very um, rigorous, thorough, and effective uh, policy process for the school board. And um, it felt important to establish that. So we are just establishing it. And if you look, it's, it's really the, the DB-R that matters. And the board doesn't ever have to vote on this. I just like to bring that up to the board's attention that we're working on this. Um, and it, it's not overly specific, but it just kind of talks about the process that we are following and that we will kind of follow for the foreseeable future and the topics that really need to be discussed. For instance, you know, staffing, enrollment, that sort of thing, things that drive our budget. Um, we have to really study these things and show the public that we're doing the work. And then we are able to bring that to the town council and share this, you know, rigorous process so that the town council then can see that we've done our work. So that's really what that one's all about. And then the last um, issue, which really isn't on the agenda, but the policy committee asked me to raise is that um, we, well, I think I say we in that way that I'm not doing any of this work, but I think Kathy is doing this work <laughs> with the help of Jen Lackery is um, going through our policies to um, look for gendered language and trying to make the language just gender neutral um, and not changing any substance of the policies at all, but, you know, eliminating, you know, her and him and just having the student or the teacher, that sort of thing. Just wanted to raise that awareness with the board. Great job, Kathy, for doing that. And Elizabeth, that's really, I like fabulous. to take all the credit and do none of the work. So <laughs> it's all Kathy and Jen. Thank you for those updates. Um, moving on, are there any school board agenda requests? I did hear Phil's request earlier in the night. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, second. I'd like to second Phil's request about uh, having a COVID, a specialized COVID update. Right. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely noted. Are there any other requests, uh, Cindy? I Hi, I'd like to add uh, to next month's agenda, just a discussion of overall um, kind of our strategy for COVID communications as well. I think the updates that we got tonight were um, very thorough and I would like to, you know, it's not just in requesting an update, but to have the board spend some time discussing what that might look like and what areas we'd like to see included. Okay, anything else? Uh, moving on, committee reports passed. Um, honestly, the last meeting we had, Donna, do you remember? It was all of like 10 minutes. I showed up five minutes late. I don't even know what they said. I think they just took roll call, said they're plugging along and that was basically it. There wasn't much new information. So I don't know, maybe I'll have more to share next time, but it was the fastest meeting I've ever been in <laughs> to say the least. Um, policy, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Nothing else to add. Okay, great. Um, DEI, uh, we are continuing to meet bi-weekly. Um, we're starting to get into some really nitty gritty work. There are different cohorts that are meeting and discussing. Um, I am on the PD group and um, we start by sharing, Kathy, what's it called? Sharing accomplishments? I know that's not what we're calling it, but what is it called? We're sharing- Tickets to do. To do's, yeah. And, Tick and Tickets to do, yeah. Tickets to do. And I am just still amazed at all the little pieces um, that, are, that are coming to fruition in all the schools. And 
the initiatives that teachers are making. Um, I was lucky enough to participate in the workshop through the Racial Equity Institute that uh, Donna mentioned last week. Um, I feel like every individual should um, should be a member of a three hour workshop at the very least of that. It was, it was amazing. Um, I have a newsletter that I'm, I'm about to send out uh, with a little bit of write up about that experience. I'm not gonna speak too much about it because you'll be able to read about it and it's late. Um, but the work continues to, to move forward. And as a district, I'm proud that we have taken um, this task force and uh, really uh, making some changes through it. Um, the school building committee, we are, I'm not sure where we are in the process, Donna, maybe you can help me. We've got applications. Um, oh. I'm on the review, the interview committee. We're reading through, we're going to narrow it down and start to have some interviews later this month. Is yep. that the we update we have? Yeah, we received, um, we did a request for qualifications and we received nine packets. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, yeah, so we're reviewing those and we will be doing some interviewing at the end of the month, so. Which is the first step that needs to happen to move forward. So um, there is work being done there. It can be, it can feel quite slow, but when you do a process like this, I'm definitely learning, there's a lag time where you have to wait when you post and, and wait for people to send information back in. So, um, it's not like we've been lazy, it's that we've been waiting for people to get their requests into us. Um, there's a lot of meetings coming up. Again, tomorrow, DEI task force is at 3.30 via Zoom. Policy is February 22nd at three o'clock via Zoom. We have a budget workshop coming up on the 23rd at five. And that is um, question and answers around the budget. Um, the finance subcommittee, um, is meeting at 8.30 on the 23rd. Again, that is a meeting between um, chairs of the school board, the town council, chairs of the um, finance chair in the school board, the town council. It is Marcy and John Q, who are the business manager of the town and um, the school, and then Donna, as well as um, our town manager. Um, and they're always very, great opportunities to just connect. And since we are one town concept to have some of those conversations and, and share information. Technology committee, yay, Cindy. I know she's so excited about this is um, starting back up February 24th at 1230. Um, DEI task force then will be two weeks. So we have another one on the February 24th at 330 Paths. Um, we'll meet February 25th at 8.30 and then calendar committee, we can strike. We don't need to have that. So mm -hmm. um, I think that covers the meetings coming up. At this point, um, we have an executive session that I'm hoping won't be I'm too sorry, long. I'm sorry, I know just a quick question. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Um, I put it up late. I was trying to be polite. <laughs> The school board budget workshop on February 23rd. Is there a reason why it's um, at five o'clock instead of 6.30, which is the no, regular time? I'm thinking that it's probably 6.30. I have a question mark next to that. Okay. okay. I was like, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that, for just pointing that out. So um, after we make this motion and head into our executive session, um, the board will meet, it is not public, um, and then we will leave executive session and come back in here simply to adjourn. If you would like to wait around to hear us adjourn, you are welcome to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you for sticking with this meeting tonight. I know it was very long, um, but I thought it was a very informative, helpful uh, meeting. And once again, I want to thank all of the administrators who put time into, and the nurses, I think they've all left us, but for putting the time into creating these presentations on top of all the work that you're already doing. Um, the, the public appreciates it, I know. Um, we appreciate it, it helps us answer questions to the public. So thank you so very much. Um, at this point, can I have a motion for the executive session? I move we enter into executive session pursuant to one MRSA section 4056A for the purpose of discussing a personnel item. Uh, may I have a second? I'll second that. 
Okay, and um, Heather Altenberg's yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolt. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura didn't know how to leave. So thank you, everyone. Um, if you are not aboard, if you could sign off and good, I am pressing. Okay, we are recording. We're back in session. I have a motion. Yeah, I'll make it because I actually wanted to say one thing in public, which was to remind everyone to get their questions in to me by Friday on the budget. Um, I didn't have a chance during the other part of the meeting. So um, I'll consolidate them. There will be, if there's questions that come up, um, obviously not, you can ask them, but it's, it's uh, I like the way Elizabeth did it and you can consolidate questions where some people have overlap. So that's just my plug to get them in by Friday. And with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn. May I have a second? A second. All right, Heather Altmerg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolt. Yay. Jen McFay. Yay. And Laura Dineno is no longer here this evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you have a great night. Thanks. Be well. You too. Take care. Good night. Oh.